Okay, we're recording. Great, I'll get going then. Um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is January 18th, 2022. It's 11 a.m. And I call this meeting to order. So um, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, just a few administrative details before we get started. Um, our new uh, regular meeting schedule for the foreseeable future is Mondays at 11. Um, you know, last year we were doing Fridays at 11. This year uh, we're going to do Mondays at 11, and we'll probably adopt a formal meeting schedule sometime soon on that. Um, we've officially transitioned the medical cannabis program, including Lindsay, Meredith, and Melissa, from the Department of Public Safety to the Cannabis Board. Um, all patients and caregivers have been notified, but um, again, the new address, if you're mailing us something, is 89 Main Street, third floor, um, Montpelier, Vermont, 05620. Uh, the phone number is still the same. That's 802-241-5115. The website is still the same. Um, however, it will migrate to the ccb.vermont.gov website um, in February. And um, there's a new email address if you're contacting uh, Meredith, Melissa, or Lindsay by email, and that's ccb.med, M-E-D, at vermont.gov. Finally, um, just a big thank you to all the members of the public who've been submitting comments to us. Um, I know it's a lot to keep up with the pace that we've worked at, um, particularly given that um, most people don't have all day to you know, watch our meetings and read through our rules. Um, but uh, we really do as a board appreciate it. We're not gonna get this right um, unless we're hearing from the people who are gonna be most directly impacted. Um, so thank you. This is our final week um, of our official public comment period for rules one and two. Um, we're gonna hold a series of meetings in the near future to discuss those comments and adjust our rules um, accordingly before they go to the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. So that's it um, from uh, administrative details. Um, Julie and Kyle, have you had an opportunity to review the minutes from January 10th? Yes. Yes. Um, I take a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, so moving to the agenda. Um, first up, um, we're going to have a discussion of our peer networking events for social equity applicants. Um, I think we all remember that this was something that has been requested from um, our social equity subcommittee of our advisory committee, as well as brought up multiple times um, at the um, public the town hall meetings that we did on social equity. We know I've been to a few of them that these are happening around the state, but you know, having a much more coordinated effort um, could be very helpful. So. Julie, I think you've been doing some work on this. And I have, and and um, on that with the, the other um, groups that are forming around the state, this certainly isn't to take away from any of those, but to add to sort of that effort that's occurring sort of organically um, throughout the state for this. So I think the goal of these networking ses sessions is to do um, some peer-to-peer -peer networking among um, social equity applicants and economic empowerment applicants. Um, with a regular speaker series on sort of the topics that have kind of risen to the surface as like the most immediate need and sort of at a high level. So folks that can, um, you know, hear from some panelists, hear from some experienced folks, and then have conversations, um, you know, and network. So that is sort of the goal. The goal is to start on January 27th from 5 to 7. The in-person location would be here. Um, and then we'll have uh, remote attendance available as well. The first two, um, so it, just to back up for a second, the, the plan is to do them every other week from January 27th through March. Um, you know, assuming that we have the participation for that and we can, you know, keep up with the speakers and so forth. I think it would be great if we as a board kind of rotated hosting and took turns hosting. I'm happy to do the first one. And then if we could take turns doing that, that would be fantastic. Um, and we can talk about the day and time um, for that. But one of the pieces of that networking um, and one of the recommendations, I think, from the subcommittee was that uh, folks have an opportunity to sort of see the board and, and get to know the board um, as part of this process. 
So the first two um, uh, sessions, the first one would be on building relationships with your local government and navigating that permitting process. Um, and we have some folks who've been through that um, coming in to speak and um, a regional planning professional coming to speak and then also um, someone from municipal government coming to speak on that to sort of give some insight on how to manage those relationships. And then proposed for the second one, which would be February 3rd, is the key elements of a successful business plan. So those seem like the first two things that people would be, if they aren't working on those and well underway with those, that they might want some sort of guidance and connection on um, to start with. But I think that that covers it. That's great. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and are there kind of key folks that you're working with to kind of generate topics? Yeah, so I've reached out to folks who brought this to us through public comment and, and spoken with them to get some some topics. Um, and that's why I've only gotten through two, but <laughs> I'm hoping as we move forward with this, you know, the topics that people want to hear about will sort of rise to the surface or be recommended or suggested by participants. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. And I think just given the three of our contacts around in and around the state, whether it's state agencies or folks like Efficiency Vermont or informational sessions that can help people unpack a little bit more of our requirements and so on and so forth to figure out a starting point, nothing else. So we're planning to have some signups online, I think starting early next week, perhaps. And um, we'll have more information as well. Great. All right, Any, uh, anything else on um, peer, network, peer networking? No. No? OK, so um, thanks for the work on that. I do think that there's a lot of value there. Um, and even if it's answering questions, particularly right now, where there's a lot of ambiguity out there. I think it could be very helpful. Um, so um, that's great. Uh, continued discussion on fee proposals is next. Um, I think um, you know, Bryn had sent around some information to the board about the fees in other states for things that we talked about last week, um, including on-site consumption lounges, delivery licenses, um, special event licenses, et cetera. Um, you know, I think it's really tough for us to just pick a number on those uh, without knowing what the kind of regulatory um, compliance is going to look like. Uh, you know, obviously the fee is always just one piece of what these licensees are going to have to deal with with respect to um, startup costs. And so I think before we kind of really open the can of worms about what those fees should look like, I think we should also kind of tie in a conversation around more specifically what the regulations we suspect would be. And again, these are not allowed currently. They're prohibited currently. So we also don't want to get too far ahead of the legislature, um, you know, on this issue um, until they specifically authorize these. We might not want to kind of go down any one road too far um, because really it's dependent on them to kind of approve of these concepts. That being said, uh, we do have um, to kind of, I think, come to a conclusion about the um, the cottage, uh, the tier three uh, manufacturer. And, you know, the same consideration comes into play. What exactly are the regulations going to look like? We have some basic, a basic framework. Um, but uh, until we kind of really determine what this looks like in rule, it's kind of hard to understand what it, an appropriate fee would be. And I think about, you know, fees, generally speaking, not saying anything that we don't all know, are supposed to cover services. So how much of a regulatory burden is inspecting or regulating this license set going to cost the board? And, um, you know, all of that ties into how often or if we inspect and if we inspect how often we inspect what um, what the kind of other regulatory compliance looks like for these licensees. So I think, you know, having a placeholder number in there right now is important um, because the legislature is trying to pass a fee bill right now. But I think, you know, that placeholder number could be tweaked um, depending on 
what specifically this license type looks like. So I think a good number that it's just comes to mind for this, just thinking about if we are gonna inspect these folks, even if it's not every year, maybe once every two years, um, is $750, which I think is at least half of the tier two. I can't remember where we landed on tier two. It's in line with one of the small cultivator proposals. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay. So Bryn, I think we're gonna just have 750 as our placeholder number for tier three manufacturers. Okay. Um, I think we should also try to work out um, the new mixed tier license fees. Um, I have a formula that kind of made sense to me that I could propose, um, unless anyone has, you know, specific thoughts. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we decided that it outdoor tier one um, would be a thousand feet or 125 plants. So if you look at the kind of cost, the fee per plant that works out to about $6 per plant. And so I use that and what's fortunate also is that that is consistent with our tier one our mixed tier one which um you know i think was it essentially when you subtract the cost of the thousand square feet indoor um you know i think it's eighteen hundred dollars for the tier one mixed tier so that you subtract the fifteen hundred for indoor and then you divide the remainder by the 50 plants and it works out to six dollars a plant also so I don't know if that was by design or not, but it, essentially the $6 fee per plant, if you apply that to tier two and tier three next year, would be for a tier two, um, $2,250, which is the $1,500 indoor fee plus $6 times 125 plants. And for the tier three, um, it would be the $3,750 um, dollar fee for a $2,500 indoor license type plus um, $6 times 200 plants, which which turns out to be 4,950. I think we should just bump it up to 5,000. That sounds, I mean, I think the logic is sound. I think there's some other states that do, um, I'm trying to remember where I saw it. Um, and I can't, but I think there are some other states actually that use a formula like similar to that. So unless we think that there's some sort of kind of some reason to just not follow that formula, um, I think that those those numbers make sense to me. So again, it'd be a tier two mixed tier cultivator would be 2,250 and a tier three would be 5,000. Way better logic than trying to pick a number out of a hat. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense to me. So, okay. Is it worth running those by, you know, BS just to make sure that they're consistent with some of our other B proposals? Yep, it is. Do that. But for now, that can be kind of our placeholder. Okay, any other feed discussion that we need to do today? No? Not from me. No. no, I don't think so. All right, well then the bulk of today's meeting really is around um, reviewing rules one and two. Um, I, mean, I am very proud of the work we all did to get these rules drafted and submitted um, considering um, the time crunch that we were under. And I think we all recognize that that time crunch was somewhat artificially created by the legislature, but um, that May 1st date is not totally arbitrary. You know, it's really the date that we need to start issuing outdoor cultivation licenses if those folks are going to have any chance of participating in year one. Um, we certainly don't want to push them out and then have them come into a heavily saturated market in year two. So um, I think the pace really was necessary, but we do, I think, just having reviewed them last week and you know, over the weekend, just have some further refinement that we need to do, um, which I really see as a two phase process. Um, first, we need to review them specifically with small cultivators in mind. Um, 
a lot of our regulations, at least from my perspective, were designed to ensure that larger entities don't um, intentionally or unintentionally undermine our, our consumer safety and public safety mandates. Um, but the risk from small cultivators um, on those fronts is much less, and we should be reflected in our regulations, the kind of lower risk. And um, the second phase really is to kind of look at all of the public comments we received and, and look at our rules um, more globally and make adjustments. So um, I think today my vision is to start with that kind of small cultivator review. Um, and then, you know, next week and thereafter move to the kind of more global review of the rules and fine tune based upon public comments. So I'm going to put the rules on the screen. Um, and I think, you know, I've got a list of all the sections that I think could we could adjust. Um, and so I'll just go through them and I'll have similar lists or similar places you'd like to go. Um, we can just kind of go through them line by line. I actually thought it might be helpful just very quickly before we get started to review our small cultivator mandate. So the first three sections, I think, are the most relevant here. So again, it's the intent of the General Assembly to move as much of the illegal cannabis market into the regulated market um, for the purposes of consumer protection and public safety. Um, and, you know, the legislature really wants us to focus on small local farmers. So small cultivators, which again is defined by statute, um, shall be prioritized over larger cultivators during the initial application period. And then the kind of subsection C is the really important one is just that the board shall consider the different needs and risks of small cultivators and make exceptions or accommodations for these cultivators um, when appropriate. So I think that's really what we're gonna be focused on now, which, which of our rules, um, and regulations probably don't need to apply to small cultivators. Now I'll just pull up the rules. I just, if you don't mind, just grab my mouse, to make it a little bit. All right, so my first proposal doesn't come until 1.4.2. Does anyone have anything before that? Yeah. Well, everything else, that's pretty procedural to that point, it seems. Okay. So 1.4.2. This is what's required um, for all cannabis establishments. Um, anyone seeking a license has to submit the following as part of their application. So we have individual's legal name, individual's address, date of birth, copy of a driver's license, set of fingerprints, any authorization um, to do a background check. Again, these background checks are mandated um, in the statute. But when we get down to um, G, 
through to J. So again, and I was the one that proposed these, but a description of any criminal action against an applicant, principal or person, um, a description of any civil action, description of any administrative action, um, a description of any disciplinary action. So this is the applicant himself or herself actually writing out kind of what we would expect to find in a criminal history check or if we did a check on civil actions or administrative actions. Um, and the point of this was really that um, we aren't authorized to share criminal history records, but we can we are authorized to share with relevant state agencies. Um, you know, a description of that's supplied by the individual. Um, and I'm wondering really, which is really important um, in certain instances, but I really don't know if it's important for small cultivators, tier one cultivators. And it could be overly complicated. I mean, you know, potentially a farmer might not fully understand what action the state has taken against them in a old criminal case. Um, you know, if he or she pled, you know, NOLO to a case or got diversion in the and the crime was expunged. You know, there it might, you know, there are some complexities of our legal system that might lead someone to unintentionally make a false statement to the board and then we're in a somewhat of a strange place um so i think that this is important for larger licensees but i would consider waiving g through j for tier one cultivators my only question is and, and this is coming from my experience at the agency of agriculture there might be some folks that from an administrative perspective have done something been in violation of the RAPs or something else that we might want to know about before we allow them to do another um, activity on agriculturally designated land. So um, I'm wondering if it still might be prudent to understand potential administrative actions from an ANR VAFM perspective in the context of is is are you in good standing with the state um, before we allow you to do certain things on that piece of property not necessarily from a criminal right per background perspective but but recognizing that there might be some issues jurisdictionally with other agencies um and i know that this is something that that happens in the context of seeking grants at the agency of agriculture you can't do anything if you're in violation of and i'm wondering if that might make sense to to hold on to some so then maybe wave G and H, but not I and J. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Okay. I, I think I think we're just going to need to know. And I mean, it's harder for us to coordinate it with other agencies to understand you might have. And I know that the agency of ag specifically, and I use them because I come from that, that world doesn't take this type of action all too often. I think that they look to to seek other ways to do business but you know i don't want to have to call over to there every 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 time we're at this decision point so i would suggest that in the spirit of understanding the the status of that specific land and actions taken upon it we hold on to certain things but that makes sense to me certainly you're in favor of the criminal action and civil action being and there. and really just to make sure i understand this what we're waiving is that we're not asking them to fill it out in the application. That's right. Right. Yeah. So it's not that if there was a if there was um, you know money laundering or any of the other concerns that might sort of um, trigger those FinCEN right. whole memo things. It doesn't. We're not waiving that piece of it. It's just that we don't need them to make a list for right. us. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and you know again this also was partially designed to help ease the process of the financial institutions. Essentially, this is double work for, for the licensee. If they're giving it to us and we're allowed to kind of share some of this with a financial institution, um, then they don't have to then do it again, all over again for the financial institution. Um, but I do think that, yeah, I think G and H, again, even the, you know, yeah, I think we're, we're all in agreement. Yep. Yeah. So, Wave G and H for tier one cultivators. Yeah, I just want to know that they're in good standing if depending with other agencies that we're we have to work with. Yeah. 
You're leaving K. Sorry. I think that makes sense. Oh, yeah. I think that's kind of in line with I and J. Yeah, and that's specific to a cannabis cultivation right. or otherwise other cannabis licenses, not any any other state license that you may have not. I mean, we could be more clear if we want to be in that. Uh, that's what I remember the intent being, but I, I could be wrong. Anything in 1.4.3? Not with respect to small cultivators, small cultivators and waving. Okay. So 1.4.4. 1. Um, again, this is these are things that an applicant has to put in their actual application. So show a plan to register or comply with any board required third party systems. Um, for example, the inventory tracking system. I think that um, this could just be an attestation that you will comply. You know, showing a plan, I don't even really know what that might look like. Um, you know, just attest to the fact that, I mean, we will know um, whether you're using these third party systems or not. So showing a plan to me seems a little bit kind of like paperwork. Um, yeah, so, that's it. that makes sense. Yeah, so just attest that you, that you will comply with any board required third party systems. Um, and I'm honestly okay with waving B through D for, um, for small tier one cultivators. So I, I thought about this too, um, over the weekend and I was kind of going between waving or just making the application specific, you know, so that it's easy to fill out and, and. I think in general, what we would expect from a tier one cultivator is different than what we would expect from a tier three. So I don't know if it needs to be waived or there just needs to be, you know, a sentence versus paragraphs of description. So uh, they're going to be tier one cultivator, all cultivators, all licensees will be subject to the health and safety regulations. So I, I don't I just don't see why submitting a plan. I know the plan kind of gets tier one cultivators thinking about this, yeah. but to me this seems like something again that um, might if I were just reading this and I and I didn't have any other guidance and I know we're planning on submitting guidance, I would think that this would be, you know, a little burdensome to try and think, well, what does the board really want as far as a health and safety plan, a storage and record keeping plan, an inventory control plan? I mean, they can look at the regulations and see what's required, but this seems to be a secondary step that doesn't add much if they if they're already looking at the regulations and seeing what's required. Yes, I'm fine with that. I went yeah. back and forth. Yeah, there's up two minds that. In the inventory control plan, I mean, they are everyone's going to be part of the inventory tracking okay. system. So I just don't know how much more you would say. The only question I have. For, for us to, to talk about is with C to so submit a storage and record keeping plan. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about it in the context of we are going to allow outdoor growers. And I know not all outdoor growers are small cultivators, but but recognizing that I would imagine a majority of them could likely be we're allowing outdoor cultivators to bring in their genetics, their, their vegetative plants inside during winter months. And so do we want from a storage perspective and and that's where my mind goes specifically with with respect to subsection C. Do we still want that plan on what they are likely going to do, where they're where it's going to be, how they're going to be storing them? Just a question for us to consider. I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with the direction that this is going, but that's kind of my one thought. The way that I'm looking at all of this right now is that the tier one cultivators are already out there operating. They're already doing, they're already growing. Um, they're already kind of doing these things. Um, and the risk to them, the risk of them getting licensed is much smaller than it is for everyone else. I know that we're all kind of understanding that, but you know, I just, I don't see it necessary for them to change what they're doing right now. And the storage plan to me, 
you know, I guess they could just describe how they're doing things currently, but it's, it's like, it's not going to change anything by them having a storage plan in their application. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm just wondering what do we want and, and or need to know, right? Yeah. So you know, we could build in some parameters in the, you know, in rule two about what you need to do if you're going to bring those inside, or we could, in my mind, allow folks to tell us what they intend to do. I don't know if we need to do both. I just, yeah, I know what you mean. Well, essentially anything that we require here, you know, we have to verify whether it's true, not necessarily, but we, we should be verifying whether it's true. And if it's not true, then it leads to problems. So uh, does someone having a storage plan and then violating that storage plan, is that something that we think is important enough to regulate? Just to add to, I think the direction that you're going the other way I thought about this when I was looking through these is how much do we want people to spend time creating a business plan now knowing that they need to start I mean that they're going to have to make adjustments to meet the other regulations that we've written um you know how much planning if they're already operating do we need them to do versus kind of adjusting what they're already doing to meet the regulations that are really like the security requirements for right yeah, no, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Just wanted to ask the question because when I saw storage, that was where my mind immediately went to. Maybe when we wrote it, it was more in the context of records um, or administrative, you know, concepts around storage and record keeping. So I just want to make sure that we are all on the same beat when it came to what we want to see from that storage of. Yeah. And that might be also, you know, I know it's a slippery slope with the word with any of these generic terms, but, you know, pesticide usage, other input storage and usage and so on and so forth that we need to see all that. I mean, it's it's made up for in our regulations and other state regulations too, but um, no, I get it. I mean, there, some, one thing that we were thinking about when we were crafting this is it's good to have people at the outset be thinking about these things. But again, this some of this seems like a paperwork exercise considering that People are going to be subject to these rules, regardless if they submit a plan or not. But anyway. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, point well taken. What passes the smell test for an adequate plan and without even guidance from us, I think it leaves a lot of folks wondering where to start and what's satisfactory, you know. And that's where, you know, lawyers come in to fill the gap, but right. they charge money for it. Sure. So. Um, in there. That's <laughs> good. No, I'm cool with that. All right, so I have the waiving D through D for tier one cultivators. And so the hiring um, kind of. So I. I was thinking that J through L might be waived or. And this kind of again harps on the definition of employee, right. um, but uh, whether it should apply just to people with three or more employees. I thought that was kind of an alternative way to do it. Um, that was my sort of thinking, and also, um, you know, I I sort of imagine I don't know if this is true or not that most small cultivators will either be sole proprietors, or have right? Seasonal workers. They might have seasonal workers, and they might also be family. Right. So I wonder if. Um, you know, we could say like three employees if those employees are not family, like if they're, if it's a, a partnership between spouses or, you know, siblings or something like that. I don't know that they need to follow this, the same, um, you know, the general roles and responsibilities of staff. If you have one or two people or even three people, you know, those three people are going to do generally everything, right? Right. right. So... I think it's cleaner for us just to say waive it for tier one cultivators because um, we don't have to get into the pickier issue of how to define employee yet, but I think we do have to do that. Um, and I forget what we've said in statute. I know there's definition of employees um, in statute elsewhere that we could just rely on. Um, but I think waiving J through L for small for tier one cultivators is maybe a starting point. And we're not actually waiving that they will get safety training. They just don't have to provide a plan in advance. Right. Yeah. Okay, keeping eye. 
sorry, waving J through L, just making sure I had the right notation. I mean, do we want to wave all? Yeah. Wave all? Yeah. All right, I threw L. I thought it might be helpful, but no. All right, yeah, I threw L. 1.4. Or did anyone have any, anything else on 1.4.4? All right, one point four point five. So the bond or escrow for cessation of operations, um, very important. And um, once you get to be a certain size, I think uh, I've been trying to think. I mean, essentially, what it, the concern is is that you have all of uh, legally licensed cannabis in your possession, whether it's in crop or in storage, and all of a sudden your business is bankrupt uh, or you have to cease operations for one reason or other. This the idea of the bond or escrow was to have at least some money set aside uh, to kind of wind down your business and make sure that that cannabis is either stored or uh, there's a plan for it. Um, I think uh, on this that um, we could wait. We could waive this for tier one cultivators. I really, you know, it would be antithetical to our mission for that to, for that cannabis to end up on the illicit market, um, legally grown cannabis. But I've been talking to a few folks um, in the hemp world about the cost of destruction of a crop, and honestly, it seems very minimal. Um, and so, you know, if the main concern is whether that legally grown cannabis ends up on the illicit market. Um, I think we should just make sure, and I think we do in our regulations, that if there is a cessation of operations, that that cannabis either gets legally sold to another licensee or is destroyed. And it shouldn't be all that expensive to do that. We left 1.4.4E, uh, e, which is the plan, essentially. Mm -hmm. I agree that the bond or escrow is not necessary. Right. Yep, agreed. Yeah. Okay. So wave that for tier one. That's all I had for 1.4.5. Does anyone else have anything there? Nope. I have something. I mean, we've gotten some requests from the Department of Tax to add a few things here, but we can do that at our next meeting. Um, anything on 1.4.6? I don't think so. We need to know yeah. where these are going to be. Yeah. 1.4.7. 8. 9. My only question here was going back to what is an employee? Right, so who, right. who has to participate in this part of this process? Which we can define later, but that was my only. Right, exactly. Um, you know, in, in Vermont, I think, you know, for purposes of providing health care, it's anyone who works at least 20 hours a week. Um, we could say something like that. I don't I don't know how they deal with seasonal workers. Um, I'm sure anyone at the Agency of Agriculture could give us some advice on that. Um, I don't know how they deal with family members that are being, you know, compensated in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. We could also think about it in terms of full-time equipment. You, know, you might have a number of people who come in and out of your business working for different parts of the year. How many, you know, you added up all the hours they work, how many FTEs do you have at the end of the year? Yep. So again, yeah, I mean, I would consider waiving this for small cultivators being B through D, but you know, the structure that we have here is based on employees, not, not, you know, your license type. So maybe we just leave it for now. And until we resolve our employee conversation, think about whether small cultivators should be a part of this. Yeah. And I think some, depending on what happens at the legislature with S-188 might change some some things because they would be agricultural workers and, yeah. and not commercial workers. And I'm not an employment law expert, but I would imagine that there are some nuanced differences there. But 
I know who, who we can talk to at the agency of ag you know, for some, some guidance there. Okay, so why don't we hold off on making any further changes to that section right here? So, okay. Next is one point. Next on my list is 1.5.2. Does anyone have anything before that? Nope. So I wanted to waive this, the entirety of this section. Um, I guess it's really just A and B. Um, not for all tier one cultivators, um, but just tier one cultivators that are um, um, home occupancy growers. And again, the thought here is these people are already growing. Like this is something that they've been doing. There's no additional impact by bringing these folks into the system. Um, you know, the whatever is going on from a municipal water supply standard is already happening. I mean, for in home, there's probably very few that are actually on a municipal water supply. Yeah. So again, if we're trying yes. to really make, you know, make the folks that are already growing, you know, licensed regulated growers, then, you know, this to me seems like that, you know, we've already, this seems a little over unnecessary. Um, I know that, you know, when we come to energy, water and environmental requirements that we're on slightly different ground, and I know that we really don't want to create additional impacts there, but, um, you know, this would just be for a subset of tier one, um, people that are currently growing in their house. Maybe maybe it should be all tier one, I don't know. I think I'm okay with that under those set of circumstances. If you're going out and leasing a new space, especially an indoor space, I feel like this should be required. But if you're just have a small grow in your, in your basement or your garage or in your spare bedroom, I just don't, I don't think this is necessary. Yeah, and I mean, for the record, NR wanted us to apply this tier five and six cultivator applicant stuff to every single cultivator, and I already tried to make some accommodations for the smaller folks, but if we yeah. think we need to do more, and I mean, this gets back to that kind of uh, incubator license type that I was right. referring to, maybe viewed it from that perspective, I think, you know, I think that makes sense. I think if we were in a state with larger water concerns, like out west, I might feel differently. I think I'm okay with that. Okay. I actually don't have anything left on rule one. So Okay, I don't I don't have necessarily anything either. I had a question about change of control, but I think that's more about whether or not we would charge fees for that. You know, like for a small cultivator if they change control. I don't think we've discussed that. Yeah, I thought that we were treating change of control as a new application. And then. So I guess I'm wondering if um, it's change of control of a small cultivator, do they need to reapply? Is that one of the um, things that we can change our way of for small cultivators? It seems like we would want them to, we would want to be notified, right? you know, um, and so whether that requires a new application or not, I don't know. Um, I, we could easily, you know, just, well, we could 
waive the fee or prorate the fee or do whatever um, else we can do to kind of make the transition easier. Um, so, you know, we certainly want the informa information of the new licensee that we would want of the prior licensee. So, yeah, I guess my question is, do they have to go through the entire process and pay a new license fee or is that um, can we simplify that process a little bit? Because if you've just if you've just gotten your license and then you change control, then you have to do everything all over again. Well, you'd have all your application materials ready, presumably, except for right. the ownership piece. So I guess it really comes down to is the fee overly burdensome. Right. And so I think. I mean, you know, I don't see why we couldn't prorate the fee so that, you know, if you've been operating for six months, that the new change of ownership fee, I mean, with the way we have it now is the, the, the kind of change of ownership triggers a new licensing period. So, you know, from the date of the change of ownership, you have a, your license is good for a year. So there, I think there's, I don't know. What would you like to see? Um, I would, and I think we need notice that there's change of of ownership and control. But I, I, I think we should propose if we can for prorating the fee. So it would really be more of a fee refund, I think, to the original licensee yep. of a prorated portion. Are we allowed to? Do this stuff. <laughs> this is money that the board, you know, is using um, to operate. Yep. And you know, any fee discussion that might implicate our operation, you know, usually requires legislative approval. But you know, we can kind of tweak the rules in a way that it's not necessarily lost money. This seems to me to be within your discretion, as long as that licensing fee comes to the board. I would imagine we would have the authority to refund a portion of it as long as it's being recouped by the new licensee. Are we silent on this in our rules currently? In that section of our rules where we discussed kind of change of ownership right now? That it's 115 three. The board does retain it's 115.2. And under subsection D, the board does retain discretion to waive or reduce fees upon or such renewals. So it's in there in some sense right now, although it's not spelled out the way that you're talking about. So it's not really lost money to the board because the new owner is paying for a full year fee. Um, so there's no real, we refund the unused portion of kind of a licensee's fee. It's not really, uh, or the board's in that, is in no worse position really. Um, so I don't know if we want to be more explicit than this. I mean, as long as, well, I mean, as long as we do it consistently. Right. There's nothing that requires us to do it one way or the other. And if we all win the lottery and go do something <laughs> else and another group of people are sitting here, as long as they do the same thing. Right. Again, I'm, I'm just trying to think about it. You know, the, the fee is designed to offset our regulatory compliance in, in enforcement. So if a small cultivator has just been in, inspected and we've spent the money that their fee was supposed to cover. And if they then ask for a partial refund, then we are, I guess, in somewhat of a worse position because we've spent the money. Um, yeah, I think. Um, I don't know. I guess maybe we should be explicit for small cultivators and then leave it this way for. Yeah, for others. She would be entitled to a partial refund or something. Yeah. If I, I think refund. what I was thinking about was if a small cultivator decides they don't want to do this anymore, I want to make it as easy as possible for them to transfer their business to someone else. 
rather than um, abandoning the business. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, we're agreed conceptually. I think we need to. <laughs> so that's a decision. Well, we'll draft. We'll bring it up. Yeah. Thing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I didn't have anything else. Nothing else in rule one. I don't think so. At this time. Rule two. All right. Um, my first comment or suggestion is 2.2.1. Anyone have anything before that? Oh, nice. Okay. So on this one, these are the records that uh, any licensee is required to maintain on site and accessible. Um, F uh, may not be necessary period for anyone, um, depending on the system that we go with, you know, is most likely we're gonna have, we're, we'll records. have those records um, available to us um, already, but we don't know what system we're going with. So maybe it's okay to keep it for now, but I think we should waive this at least for now for um, tier one cultivators. Yes. Kyle, oh, that's fine, yeah. sorry. Um, and then N, N to me um, should be waived for tier one cultivators. That to me really seems like a paperwork exercise for people that have already been operating. Um, and you know, what I've heard just anecdotally is you know, some attorneys around the state are more than welcome to create a standard one that all small cultivators can submit to us. And again, they're gonna charge for it. Um, but I don't know how much value there is if everyone is just submitting the exact same one to us. How does that look for the um, products that someone might use in cultivation? I mean, usually, so SOPs can also be six safety standards. Uh, you know, use and disposal and 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 that sort of thing, documenting how you do that. Is there a safety reason to keep the SOPs? I mean, maybe that's only true if you have, you know, one or two other employees that you're certain that you have some standards that your employees are following. If they're one out of two other people. Um, yeah, I'm thinking more about what what you might use. Yeah, I mean, now that we do ask for other, like an integrative pest management plan, I wouldn't want, you know, that's kind of specific and not necessarily, I could mean this, but it's also its own separate thing. And I think if we have those, few instances where that we need this information, regardless of what you want to call it. I'm fine with waiving the standard operating operating procedures manuals found in it. Just recognizing uh, I don't want that ripple effect to mean you're not preparing yourself if something does not go the way that you think it's going to go. Yeah. Right, I seem to remember us. There's another portion, maybe it was in role one about what you're discuss, discussing, the uh, pest management applicator. Yeah, I think it's it's somewhere in rule two. We'll get there, I'm sure. But um, so as long as we've got another place that that's addressed, that's fine. I mean, the alternative is we could create that. Right, that's, that, I, that's what I was thinking. I mean, we, we could be the ones that play it together and just say, this is how you have to operate. But again, I don't think that really takes into account the unique unique nature of each individual right yeah and we also don't really have the staff <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i did like hearing about you know michael's chickens and yeah, yeah that was interesting yeah uh, but to require that you put all that into a standard operating manual just seems seems like we might discourage some folks from 
joining the market that we would want. Yeah, no, and I think we're balancing what we need to know versus recognizing there's a lot of really good craft growers that have their processes down. And do we need to see those processes when they know more than we do about their specific business? What kind of standard would we hold us to and review? You know, so I get it. Anyone have anything else on 2.2.1? So this seems, both of these sections again, seem kind of potentially unobtainable for small cultivator. And again, we're really trying to balance the risk um, that they pose uh, versus kind of what the benefit of having this is. I think general liability insurance is an important um, for any business, um, large or small. But I think, you know, the advice I've been given is kind of for small, for tier one cultivators, and maybe for others, um, drop that down to 250,000 in insurance and 10,000 in escrow um, as an alternative to the insurance. And that um, would probably cover whatever, you know, catastrophic thing happens at one of these businesses. Um, is there a time frame? for putting the funds in escrow? I mean, the way this is written, it seems like it has to be there on the first day of licensing. Is that necessary or can they have six or eight months to put that money in escrow? I mean, the problem is, is if something happens before that, yeah. I mean, if your employee, you know, exp- you know, is right. dealing with some sort of solvent base, you know, I mean, I know yeah. that's probably not going to be a tier one cultivator, but. Um, you blow yourself up. Yeah. You blow an employee up. <laughs> or you have a visitor a on to, you have a visitor onto your farm that slips and falls. I mean, you know, it just seems like well that would be under general liability. I'm talking about the escrow. The escrow is the alternative to the Oh liability. I see. Yep. Okay, never mind. So I mean I know like you know, just setting aside an extra 10k is not gonna be easy. Um but again, I think that this is a, this is an important piece of any business. Um, maybe we could waive something for home occupancies that don't allow visitors. I think that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, this could be another argument in favor of having a kind of incubator license, but I, I actually think that just having a difference between a distinction between people that are operating out of their homes versus renting a new space and, um, you know, No, I think that makes sense. All right. And again, this, you know, when we move to the kind of broader conversation about other license types, you know, we're focused on small cultivators, but this might also make sense to apply the same standard to the kind of tier three product manufacturer or mm-hmm. you possibly, you know, other other license types. All right. Can you just clarify the decision on that one? The so the drop the insurance amounts um, to 250000 yeah. and the escrow to 10000 and that's for tier one, tier one generally, just tier one. Whether it's in home or not. Whether it's in home or not, and I don't know. And say we want to go for... further for home occupancies. Can we put a pin in that and just decide that? Yeah. And these numbers, you know, they're being recommended to me from a number of different sources. I don't know if they're the right numbers or not. It seems like ten thousand again might be inaccessible to some people but i i do think if there's a problem you want to have something set aside um anything else on this section me. Kick me. sorry <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry <Julie. laughs> I identified feet down there no i think i think that makes sense to me Just put a pin in the one okay. and again like my my thought or my in bringing that incubator type license to the conversation and it's it's just something do we care about as a board do you know my goal with that was trying to get folks the ability to move out of their home once they get to a certain level of of business ready but do we fundamentally care if a majority of our small cultivator market is growing in their home 
you know, and I don't necessarily care. I mean, they're good at what they do and it's, it's more how we feel the market should look on its face. But that was that, that concept of allowing folks more advantages to begin while they kind of get themselves ready to have it feel like a more commercial operation for lack of a better way to describe it. But if we don't necessarily feel like we need to move people out of their home, I mean, the, the statute says you can grow in your home, not directly, but on, you know, in effect it does. That was just a, a conceptual point that I wanted to raise. Do we, do we have an opinion either way? So far, I've seen maybe one or two places where if we had a smaller than incubator style license where I would apply a slightly different standard to them, but I just don't think it's enough quite yet for me to kind of say that we need it. I'm not trying to advocate for that license right now. I'm just fundamentally, do we care if folks are doing this in their home or do we want to structure things where we're trying to carrots and not sticks, move them into a more commercial feel of an operation? Does that make sense? So my, my point is here is like, if even if we lower these and waive these for you, your operation and you're in your home, is there an incentive to, other than more revenue, I guess, because you can grow more, to move beyond that? I don't know if we need to draw that distinction. I'm just asking conceptually, do we care if people are growing in their home? Yeah, and not exactly. want to move on that's where I think, you know, meeting people where they're at is important. And I think really, people are growing in their homes right now. Right. So I, I don't have any problem with people continuing to do that. And I don't feel a real need to push them to kind of a rented space somewhere offsite, um, as long as they're kind of following the general municipal rules around home occupancy. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you. I just wanted to make sure we were conceptually on the same wavelength there. I, I have one more question about this, the escrow. Um, we've talked in the past about people struggling to do banking, to have access to banks. So we may need to think of an option if an escrow account. Okay. I would imagine if I were a banker, which I am not, that a small, <laughs> a small cultivator may seem more risky to bank with than a larger operation. We, we should ask the banks about that. I mean, generally speaking, the banks don't mind taking people's money. Um, you know, I think it's really when they're lending it or they're mm -hmm. potentially, you know, banking, you know, but I, but you're right. You know, they might say, well, where'd this 10,000 come from? Is this, I think that's what I was getting at with, can they have, you know, six months to demonstrate that they've earned that 10,000 in this market versus having the not answer a question of where it came from. I think there are naturally going to be some barriers to entry just because of access to land, access to capital, and federal status. You know, I think we have to balance, is that barrier absolutely necessary? And to me, you know, the, the escrow or the liability insurance is really about if someone's injured, how, to, how do we make that person whole? So I'm just, I think, flagging it as a yeah. potential... We can ask, we should ask, um, you know, some of the bank, we can ask the kind of bankers association. Why don't we put a pin in that? I'll back. I don't know which one they would rather prefer. Get it sooner, not know where it comes from, or six months down the road. Um, anything in 2.2.3? Two point two point four. Um, so I would consider waiving A through C for tier one cultivators because I really think my concerns here are covered by E and D. Mm -hmm. We're essentially saying comply with everything and report breaches. Um, to me, that's that's the real thing that we're concerned about, especially for smaller operations, you know, sole proprietors or maybe one employee. Um, 
I mean, these are important things. A through C are important, but I really do feel like, uh, you know, everything that we're worried about, we're requiring disclosure and um, compliance in D&E. Okay. Anything else on this one? No. Um, 2.2.5. Employment and training. Some of these really just aren't applicable to a, a small cultivator. You know, some of this is really kind of aimed at retail. Um, so on this one, I'm not sure we need one two, um, six, seven, and eight for tier one cultivators. That's one, two, six, seven, and eight. Were um, two and eight included in statute? Two. Not that I'm aware of. like the health effects of and then I don't remember if it was specific to retailers or all establishments. Yeah. I mean I think it regardless that makes sense for retailers but not necessarily for and I mean depending on our definition of employee and you know the over three employees it might not even be necessary not or required to do all of these if you don't have right. full time employees. You know so number two is per statute. By statute. Yeah. Okay. I remember that some of these were, but not all. Yeah. So that one I think has to stay. That's fine. You know, and then my other ones, the the nine through twelve, I think are very important, but I think that we need to if we can, we have the capacity, find a way to provide these trainings, whether it's linking to other organizations that provide these trainings or you know, I, I just, I think that, it, again, you know, someone gets training in human trafficking, domestic violence awareness. Is that training to, you know, their standard of what this should be? Is there any standardization on, on these trainings at all? Or? So there are certain certain industries that have done, like right. hospitality has done human yeah. trafficking um, so, and domestic yeah. violence. And um, the reason why I suggested that was because in Oregon, there was an issue with cultivators and yeah. human trafficking. So... Which so makes I, sense. I think, yeah. but I think when I proposed these, I had in mind that we would not be reinventing the wheel, that right. we would be linking people to training yeah. that they get. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. That, from a cost perspective, is that something that the license holder would burden the cost of, or we would burden the cost of? I think, it, well, if there is a cost. My assumption is that it we're, would include that in the cost of what it is to license okay. someone, like the total cost of licensing, right? Just asking. Yeah. So then. But I don't I don't know if that's what we've done or not. Like. <laughs> yeah. Then why don't we. Um, Again, like if they don't have any full time employees. Would this still apply to them as an operator? Right. You know what I mean? These are important issues. I don't want to sideline that aspect of it. I mean, certainly human trafficking, you know, it is a problem um, and um, or can can be a problem, particularly with kind of seasonal workers. Um, so why don't we look into whether or not nine through twelve, how we how we plan on on delivering those trainings, and two as well. Um, and then, um, but I think what I'm hearing is that we could waive one, six, seven, and eight for tier one cultivators. Okay. That makes sense. Okay.
Okay, anything else on that section? Oh, all right, so 2.2.6. Um, so C, all cannabis and cannabis products must be tracked using inventory tracking system from the time the cannabis is grown by a cultivator until it's sold to a consumer by a retailer. Cannabis establishments must reconcile all on the, well, it's that first sentence that I was thinking about. Um, so, you know, we, we've been dealing with this or hearing about it in public comments quite a bit. Obviously, also, there's the problem where if licenses don't get out, you know, right on May 1st or, you know, earlier, then we're going to have this problem in year one of people wanting to bring their genetics into the legal market. Um, and this probably prohibits it, I would say. This section, and then there's another section later on that we can get to when we get there, 2.2.15. So um, I don't know where I stand on this quite yet, but I, I would think that we should discuss having a potential grace period for small cultivators in year one. Uh, my question with this is, do we, I mean, ultimately we need to know the products that go to market, right? And we need to know the products that don't make it there to ensure that there's no diversions. That there's no, um, you know, saying that these plants all died and then actually diverting them to the, but I wonder if that all has to be done through seed to sale tracking, or if there's a point at which a plant has to enter seed to sale tracking for a small cultivator. And then if a plant dies and it's never gonna make it to market, is there another way to, to capture that information? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, there's obviously, there's kind of the big three, maybe four seed to sale tracking companies nationally. And then there's a host of other kind of smaller um, companies. We don't know which way we're going on that. Um, so, you know, it's hard to answer that question, even if, even if we wanted to try and answer <laughs> it. Uh, you know, it's something that maybe we could get our consultants to come in and talk to us about, yeah. um, about seed to sale tracking and, and how to do it, particularly for small cultivators in the most cost effect effective way. Um, but I, I don't think we should change this quite yet or decide on anything on this quite yet, but it is something that this, and then there's an equivalent provision in 2.2.15, where we really need to think about, you know, at the start of this market, how do we move in all of the plants that people have spent years um, kind of growing uh, the, the genetics, you know, developing the genetics on and whether we care about whether it's been tracked from seed to cultivation. I've, I've heard a lot about anxiety around this specific issue, and I've looked at how other jurisdictions have done it. And I think my thought is, even outside the small cultivator world, allowing, I think, in any potential license holder for a certain week, two week grace period to get their, their existing genetics into the system in year one their first time applying. I mean, I don't know which way we would want to go there. You know, it makes makes sense or else people are going to start you know, getting these genetics in nefarious ways that it might create unanticipated problems for us. So, think about it like immaculate conception or I don't like to say don't ask, don't tell because it has other political undertones, but you know, giving folks an opportunity to do it before they need to start tracking after they receive their license is something that I would be in in favor for. I don't think we need to you know, micromanage that. I think so much good genetics in this state that are tailored specifically to our climate here that folks have spent a lot of time trying to, you know, make marketable here. Um, and I want all of that to be included in our regulated market or else it just feeds the illicit market. Recognize that that puts us in a, in a box, but Right. I think we need to acknowledge that and, and recognize it. So what would we need in order to answer this question? I mean, one, we probably want to know a little bit more about seed sale tracking, recognizing there's a procure procurement process that we don't have much control over at this stage. We have to go through kind of a standard process on all contracts. Um, 
and we can't really talk to any potential vendors at this stage. Um, so knowing the kind of what seed to sale tracking looks like is kind of an unknown thing, except, you know, we can hear from other jurisdictions about how their process went and how how they brought in during, especially during year one, the kind of illicit genetics. Yeah, I mean, let's do our homework. Yeah, but I think some have just turned the other way and allowed folks to get things entered on a, a certain grace period before they're between when they seek a license and when inventory tracking is required in year one and then kind of solves the problem. I mean, people can't buy seeds over the Internet legally. You know, it's. It's a big. Ball of yarn we're going to find ourselves in unless we acknowledge, I think that practically speaking, it's going to be challenging. And I think I'm thinking along those lines, as long as it's tested before it goes to market. Right. And I'm not really sure. I I'm say that I don't care because I care, but I don't, I'm not sure that it matters when it and where it came that. from. Yeah. Okay. Brent, do you need uh, any more direction from us on that? Nope. I don't think that there's any real decision here for you. Nope. Um, Acknowledgement. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I was curious about the sub E, a canvas for tier one cultivators, a comprehensive inventory audit at least once a year um, from the date of the previous comprehensive inventory. I mean, it's obviously a good idea. Um, I'm just wondering how burdensome this might be to a small cultivator. Yeah, and again, I think there's just so much that we don't know until we we know the vendor that we're going with you know how easy is it to pull a certain data points that, that line up with the software we're going to go with and we're kind of between a rock and a hard place with some of the requirements of this section because we're going to need to finalize before we can I, I, I my understanding is pick a vendor i don't understand enough of what the day-to-day -day of that would look like right well then why don't we just move on from this leave it for now and or we could waive it for now and then come back to it. Yeah, I mean, I do fundamentally, you know, think that looking at the section overall, recognizing that A and E, we have potentially some changes to make is we're making a lot of accommodations for small cultivators relying on the seed to sale tracking platform to do the, the work that otherwise would be a, a paperwork requirement, so on and so forth. So it needs to be strong, recognizing that there's some grace periods and potential audits is every year satisfactory or too much? I'm, I'm I'm not sure. You know. I say we um, we leave it for now, recognizing that this whole section, um, you know, might need some tier one cultivator tweaks to it. So. Um, Okay. Anything else on this section that we want to discuss? Is there anything in your notes on this? No. Um, all right. 2.2.7 transportation. I think. You know, my first note is this is something that is not related to one cultivator, so I'll just leave it alone for now. But this might need to be tweaked if, if delivery is permitted. Mm -hmm. But I think you can just kind of do some special legislative or regulatory language um, subsequent rules. I had a question about D that I I couldn't remember the the purpose, but it says must pl take place in a vehicle. The board may waive. What would be the other? What would be another option other than a vehicle? Walking it on down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, depending. Okay, that's a good. The compost man, what's his name? That has the the mule. Vermont compost. He's got like the. I had no idea that oh, it existed. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> stuck behind him on the way to work. <laughs> I, I think it's just B is just trying to recognize that you know, depending on your specific operation, maybe. Uh, or you have neighbors down the down the street that uh, are doing a different part of the supply chain. Okay. You know. Um, yeah. 
I think that there's some, I want to look at this with more of a broader overview than, than just for small cultivators. Maybe at our next meeting or, or whenever yeah. the case may be, because I think there is some, whether it's GPS tracking or some other kind of more nuanced. The only one I highlighted was I, I wasn't sure because it talks about transmitting back to a remote computing device. Like I'm not, what would that be? If, it, if you're a small cultivator and it's just you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think what we tried to do or that subcommittee tried to do mm -hmm. was look at other jurisdictions. And this was a very watered down, these are very watered down requirements yeah. compared to some other states that have much stricter transportation requirements around what they're doing. But, th but that being said, you know, that makes sense with these larger in other state businesses where it's not just you as the sole proprietor right. and it's, it's doing so I think we just need to to look at this whole subsection um, not necessarily make any special accommodations for small cultivators but look at it generally speaking for all participants in our our market but for now I think we should waive this for small cultivators yes yeah I mean, yeah, we can make that decision now. I think if yeah. we should have a conversation about whether or not it's necessary and we can always use right. enforcement discretion, but yeah, you know, th yeah, that I discretion mean, changes. Right. What I was thinking for this is we have another place where we tie certain regulations to the amount of product you're transporting. If you hit a 20 pound threshold that you need certain additional, mm -hmm. that's kind of where I was tying it to that 20 pound. Yeah. But I think for now, just given the conversation we're having today, we should just waive this for small cultivators. Um, the other thing I had in this section is, do we need O if we have Q? So again, we're, we're saying in Q that transportation shall be under conditions. So we're saying to the transporter, do this to your the best of your ability to protect the can transport this to the best of your ability to protect the cannabis and cannabis products from loss and theft. So do we really need um, that you have to stay with your vehicle while transporting? Um, if the option to stay with the vehicle, you must choose that option. Um, I just in the reason Q to me is kind of gives a little bit of flexibility to kind of transport, especially smaller amounts that, you know, tier one cultivators will be transporting to, you know, really not have to kind of just strictly stay with their car at all times. I mean, these are unmarked cars, no cannabis will be visible. I mean, the likelihood of these being a target, I think is somewhat minimal. Um, and, you know, Q is just saying, just transport this as best you can to protect the Cannabis, cannabis products from loss and theft. So, are you talking about this in relation to just small cultivators? Like, I think pound limit. just changing that in general. I think um, O is an important one if you are a larger transporter. Um, I think I think that that and that is even you know just as you know Kyle you just mentioned that's kind of a watered down version of what other states require. Um, o. But I think for small cultivators, essentially put the onus on them to make sure that the, the, the cannabis and cannabis products are protected. But if you need to kind of make a stop unrelated to the delivery, the transportation, for some reason, you know, you're logging it, you know, you're trying to take the best, you know, standard, the best approach to protecting the cannabis. But under this, under, oh, that would be prohibited. You know, you're taking your dad to the doctor. And you're also transporting, you know, you know, a cannabis plant or, you know, you know, that would be those would be inconsistent under O, but allowed under Q as long as you're taking precautions. So you're saying wave O because Q makes up I think for Q, it effectively and I, provides more clarity and or maybe not more clarity, but flexibility. more flexibility. Yeah. OK, that makes sense to okay. me. And, and so I get it. We're over to your one, but not others. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, it's a rural state. Folks like to go out and do all their. I mean, I do it all my stuff in one trip versus special trip just for this. 
practically, I get it, doesn't make sense. Okay, Any, anything else on 2.2.7, transportation? Nope. All right, 2.2.8. Under B, I thought, and just tell me if I'm crazy here, that we could allow on-site burning for small cultivators. Yeah, these are just some, these are five suggestions. It says may but not be limited to methods. So you can dispose it in other ways. If we want to get prescriptive and add burning, I'm, I'm fine with that. I was talking to a hemp cultivator about on-site burning and it's, a widely used practice, yeah. not just, you know, in hemp, but just for a lot of agricultural establishments. Um, yeah, what, what, you know, obviously, if you need a burn, you know, it'd be subject to municipal kind of regulations around on site burning. Um, I'm wondering, do we want to? Do we want to have any role in the destruction by burning? Do we want to be on? Do we want to witness? It, do we want a video of it? You know, the, the the concern there is that someone says I'm going to destroy my crop because it's contaminated, but then they don't. Um, so, well, that could be true for anything, any of these, right? I think we're just going to have to, in that instance, rely on people being honest. I, know. I don't I, we'd have to have like how would you have a video of somebody on site composting I mean you could do that anyway you could say I composted these plants and they could still be diverted into the yeah. market I think in the hemp context they require above a certain amount someone to be to yeah. witness it oh really the yeah. inspectors okay. need to go out and actually participate yeah. in the burning but not like if it's but we've allowed compost do I misunderstand here we've allowed like composting on site composting yeah how would you know? How would we know? I think I think burning because of the nature of the plan and THC levels and potential intoxication and municipal ordinances, if they do exist around odor nuisance, I think maybe that's where you're thinking it might require a different level of scrutiny from a just trust factor that you've done certain things. But um, otherwise, I understand. I mean, is that where you're? What you're thinking yeah i mean the easiest thing for us to do would be to allow on-site burning for tier one cultivators and not say anything about the process um and then but you know if we want to allow on-site burning for larger cultivators it might require us to be there or to get a video of it so I'm fine with allowing it for small cultivators. I okay. think you're right that there are municipal ordinances that would that allow you to burn in certain places or you know have certain size fires. You might have a burn ban. You might not be able to burn it at a particular time, depending on where you're doing this. So we could, for tier one cultivators, um, just permit on-site burning if allowed by the municipality or if subject to municipal subject to municipal ordinances. ordinances. Yeah, I mean, and again, I think from a waste disposal perspective, I'm, I'm hoping that there's a lot of opportunity for remediation. I mean, you know, this was such an issue with the hemp program at the agency because if it is over that 0.3% THC, it's it's a fed, it's federally illegal. Um, so because they were operating under a USDA pilot program, they they needed a specific level oversight but there's a lot more opportunity for remediation and i think it will find it somewhere in here unless you're grossly negligent i don't know if that's the phrase we use when it comes to what you're applying you know that it needs to be just destroyed but it's not something that i hope happens all too often given the flexibility that we're providing in remediation of a product but yeah. it's still good to be clear yeah you know Again, this is like a may not be limited to, so these are just options, yeah. but they're not an exhaustive list. So, okay, so we'll add on-site burning if um, permitted or subject to local ordinances for tier one cultivators. 
Um, okay. Anything else on this one? 2.2.8? Packaging. This is another area where, you know, when you read through it, you realize that a lot of these are designed for retail right. packaging, but not necessarily intra supply chain packaging, like cultivator to product manufacturer. Right. Um, so I think what I was thinking here is there should, we should make some distinction here. I think all of this is pretty much important for products or flour that are intended for sale at a retail storefront. But for products that are not intended for sale to the public at a retail storefront, I really think it should just be packaged in a way that is secure and reasonably designed to protect it from loss or theft. And I'm using, I'm getting the language from our transportation um, requirements protected from loss of theft, as well as against physical, chemical, or microbial contamination and against deterioration of the product, which is taken from one of our transportation regulations. Is the child resistant and opaque part of statute for um, cultivators and manufacturers? So there are specific requirements or cult packaging requirements for cultivators and manufacturers. I'd have to look at the statute again to be clear on this, but I think Pepper raises a point that's not clearly disallowed, shall we say. Right. Trying <laughs> to make a distinction between product that's going to a consumer versus right. um, just going into supply chain. Does that seem about right? That if we make a distinction between the kind of products available to the public versus products available to licensees. Um, 100%. And yeah. then just say, is secure necessary? Uh, the packaging, again, the kind of key points are that it's secure, reasonably designed to protect it from loss and theft, as well as from against contamination or deterioration of product. Should it also, did you say in there that it should identify what it is? You know, I didn't. I. I thought that, oh, sorry, I have another piece here. You need to scroll down a little further. Um, it should have a label on it that includes the batch and lot number, the licensee number, and testing results if required. I was going to say like a COA. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And it contained the not safe for kids and contains THC yeah, logos. That makes sense. Yeah, but I mean, it, this all, this conversation makes sense. I mean, these are packaged in like, pound vacuum sealed bags between, you know, folks, you know, I don't know if would that meet the smell test for smell test for <laughs> for a secured, you know, method of 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 packaging between intra supply chain partners. I don't know, but um, I think we need to recognize that these little uh, resistant and opaque packages don't make sense for the type of volume that's going to move in our supply chain. It's just not realistic. And I'll, in, you know, in addition, you know, these tier one cultivators are going to have to have a transport manifest as well that kind of describes just the um, the weight and you know uh, other aspects. So, you know, I'm just thinking purely about just what the packaging needs to have is the transport manifest will kind of back up the, the rest of the stuff. Yep. Okay, so um, David, I've got some language around that that I can just send you. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, anything else on this? Packaging them. So my next comment jumps a little bit to 2.2.15. So if anyone has anything before that. Um, did we want to talk about social media under 2.2.11? Um, heard some comment about um, 
images and text regarding products for social media. I don't know how that would meet that 15, 80, 85% rule. E. E? Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Well, I think we could make some type of accommodation around imagery or text as long as it's not promoting a, a price point or or something similar thereof, you know, but if it's promoting the quality of a product, you know, that post is on a, you know, white or blue or pink background behind it and it's just a, a bud or the, the product itself. I think link then linking to an age gated website from that specific social media post, recognizing that you can age gate on Instagram and and others. It might make sense for small cultivators that don't have the wherewithal to spend money on marketing or advertising to the extent that they even can through our statute. It, it might be an opportunity for some folks to do very you know price saleable and marketing on their own behalf. So what is what would this say instead? It would allow images. It says any images or other text regarding product is otherwise prohibited, right? Yeah. It wow. would allow images. Yeah, and I mean it, it, images of the product in and of itself. And I Again. I don't yeah, I don't know that I agree. I'm bringing it up because we did receive it in public comment and I'm I don't know that it would meet that meet that ever meet the 1585 kind of advertising rule that we have. Yeah, just to be clear, just for my benefit, age gating websites are just the kind of are you over 21 or what's your birthday? Yeah. yeah. Um and so obviously that's not much of a gate. It's more of a like suggestion. Um <laughs> Uh, make sure you can uh, make sure you can count. I guess if you're yeah, under the age, yeah. <laughs> do we know? Um, do we have any way of knowing? I, I I know the answer is no. You know whether those are effective at blocking people that are underage. I don't have I don't any the, data, but I, don't I know can... the answer to that. But you know, I know that depending on how you're using social media in this context, it's not all too easy to be shut down from a operator of the you know your own account perspective if you're doing things in cannabis or other yeah. federally illegal activities they'll shut you down quickly so if you're if you're advertising in the in the wrong way and I'm I don't have Instagram's legal terms that you acknowledge as a recipient of in front of me so I don't know what that standard is necessarily but I think making some potential accommodations for folks that can't otherwise market themselves at all because of the you know, uh, limited ability to do so. Under set of, a certain set of circumstances, I could see it being valuable and you could still fall within certain parameters that wouldn't shut you down at the platform level or at our level. But how we wrap that into words on a piece, piece of paper and regulation, I, I don't necessarily know the answer to that either. So I'm not comfortable allowing any images, so I would need something more specific there to agree to something like this. You know, certainly um, something along the lines that Kyle said is much more palatable, I think, mm -hmm. than, you know, of a just blank background with a picture of a cannabis or cannabis product is much more palatable than someone, say, kind of out snowboarding and smoking a joint or something like that. But uh, so we received public comment on this so we'll have to deal with this one way or the other you know i would just this is a hot button issue yeah. on both sides you know small cultivators really need this as a way of low-cost advertising um the legislature and the prevention community and the medical society and others really this is the kind of front the new front of advertising that they're very concerned about so you have a specific proposal or, or Kyle, when, when we do our kind of public comment um, about what this could look like, happy to consider it. But sure. I, I think we should just leave it for now, knowing that we're going to have to revisit it during those public comment mm -hmm. periods. Okay. Yeah, I'm just raising it as an issue that I think we can probably find a path forward for with correct parameters. I don't have 
proposed language to yeah. satisfy everybody I, yeah. right now. I did a little <laughs> research on this yesterday, and you're 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 right that I think Twitter is the most lax when it comes to cannabis products. But everyone else, if you kind of, you know, hashtag cannabis, or if you sh if you're showing pictures that they very quickly, where they shadow block you first, and then they they suspend shadow ban you, yeah. shadow ban, and then suspend or revoke your account pretty quickly. So, in some ways, the the mark the free market has already kind of dealt with this issue. But um, but if there's specific language, I'll find they, uh, I'll. I'll present you some. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I thought we should um, talk about 2.2.13 because visitor visitors to an establishment, if we are going to make specific accommodations for folks growing in their home, that's where a lot of fire safety oversight kicks in if that for visitors. So I know we allow visitors to an establishment. I think we should specifically say if somebody's growing in their home, I mean, they can allow visitors, but they're going to open themselves up to other regulations. So how do we want to handle that? Because that was another one of the yeah. things that I had in the in the incubator license type. Yeah, I was looking at some home occupancy guidance documents, and a lot of them just in the guidance mention this, like, you know, if you allow members of the public or employees to come in, you're subjecting yourself to fire safety rules. I think it, it's not something that needs to be in rule. I think it's something that we have a kind of one page guidance document for people that are doing home occupancy. And, it, and again, it's already been created for the for a large part for other yeah. home businesses. So I don't think, you know, it's it would be too much of a lift for us to have just copy and paste sections of that and post it to our website. I don't think we need to say it here, though. OK. I, I, didn't know how we wanted to handle it, but I want. I just wanted some, whether it's guidance or whatever else, some got some clear understanding of what that line would be for folks that want to do this under the home occupation, you know, frame framework. So uh, I forgot to kind of look at our schedule. Does anyone want to take a break? I think we're rolling. <laughs> but about Bryn or David? I don't need to. I'm fine. I'm going to step out and I'll be right back. Okay. Why don't we take a five minute break? <laughs> We're all set. Great. Thank you. Okay. So we left off on 2.2.13. I, uh, anything on 2.2.14? All right. So 2.2.15, this is once again, just related to the concern I raised earlier about um, small cultivators being able to bring their genetics into the legal system. I don't think I'm ready to make a decision on this quite yet, but whatever we do in 2.2.6, it should also be reflected here. Shouldn't be in the version, yeah. Two point three point two is my next one. Anyone have any anything prior to that? Say two point three point two. Yeah. Yeah, something for that. I was just thinking wave F for tier one cultivators. Okay. okay yeah. I mean, again, you know, just like you mentioned last time in the last comment, Kyle, just if you're allowing visitors, you know, you're potentially subjecting yourself to fire safety regulation, but that, you know, recognizing that most of these folks are going to be home occupants that relying on you know having to file a safety protocol just might not be realistic do we define i don't remember in the beginning and definitions do we define what a visitor is i don't know i think my only like well 
Oh, no. and, and I ask because we kind of go between, you know, home occupation and, you know, someone who's leasing a space or renting a space or owns a different space. Um, you know, what is a visitor for a home occupant? Yep. Home occupation business versus, a, you know. So essentially, we probably want to exempt family members. Yeah, I mean, or else they're going to be in violation regardless. And yeah, it's so up to us and our enforcement discretion, but I don't really want to. And maybe it's a maybe we address it in guidance. Yep. But I just think it needs to be addressed somewhere for folks who have home occupation. <clears throat> My, I think fire safety might have something to say about it. I don't know just how, how they would define where their public building kind of their cutoff is for these home occupants. Right. I think one of the reasons that I put an F is because when visitors, you know, and I'm thinking about it in like the agritourism line of thinking, if you're going farm to farm, you're tracking microbial content yeah, exactly. between farms that can pose a risk to the plant life and health. So like you'll wear booties or something mm -hmm. like that on your shoes to prevent, you know, certain um, certain issues like that so that was a thought process no, behind, makes a lot of science sense. safety yeah. stuff and if <clears throat> there ever does become some ancillary agritourism style business between visiting multiple cultivation sites and stuff i don't want there to be unintended unintended consequences um i think it's more profound in the you know livestock dairy business arena but um it certainly could be an issue here it's just mm -hmm. But for small cultivators, it might not be 100% necessary. I, I would agree, but that that was part of the thinking. That's a good point. Yeah, I think again, this is all just how much of the market is a small cultivator is being supplied by a single small cultivator, and is you know just everything is to me you know what's the risk versus is this too much. You know, developing a safety protocol is it kind of a paperwork exercise, or is it really, really no. important? And you know, if you you got a five thousand square foot cultivation site, you know, you make up a much larger portion of the market for a thousand. But I'm comfortable waving it. Just was making sure we knew what we were waving. Yeah. Similar to the the storage component, just yeah. kind of raising it as reasoning. You know. Okay. Um, that's all I had for 2.3.2. Anyone else? No. Nope. Um, testing, I didn't have anything here. Not that it shouldn't be discussed in the context of all. Right. All cultivators. Right. The three week thing we can talk about. It. You know, we, we received a lot of comment on that this Friday. Yeah. Um, 2.3.4, I don't have anything here, 2.3.5, so I did have something here, a, um, under B, when a cultivator sells cannabis to a retailer, packaging must include everything by statute. All baseline packaging requirements in section 2.2.8 and then testing results. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, if a cultivator is selling to a retailer, they might have some arrangement where the retailer is in charge of packaging. Um, and but we're kind of pushing that off to the cultivator. And I'm wondering if that makes sense. Like is can't cultivators and retailers kind of come up with their own arrangement as to who's in charge of the kind of packaging requirements? So I, I agree with you. Yeah. I don't think this is a linear supply chain. Yeah. You know, so if you're gonna move back and forth, yep. Yeah. Step forward, one step back type of stuff before it gets to market something in some ways. 
So I'm wondering, I mean, I know these are statutory requirements, the 904D and 907C. I don't have those statutes up in front of me. Um, and I also don't necessarily, let me just see if I can go to 2.2.8. It is, okay. Do you have it right there? I do. Just leave this up then. I look it's here. the packaging. It's the list of the child resistant, opaque, all of those, the cannabis and cannabis. Yeah, that's what I thought. So it's it's kind of like, again, depending on how we change that, about interest supply chain versus prepared for, um, intended for a retail sale at a storefront. Um, this This could change as well. So... I don't know. David, do you have any advice for us on this? Um, I just, I think that whatever your decisions are, which we've already kind of made at least part way in terms of the interest supply, intra retail supply, sorry, interest supply chain packaging uh, should just be applied to this. Yeah. And then, um, which I think is within right. the intent of the statute. I think right. the statute didn't quite yeah. identify the issue yeah. that you bring up, but I do think it's within the intention of the statute. Um, and then we'll apply it to this and then maybe add a line somewhere just clarifying that ultimately, you know, a retailer, I, I think this is clear already, a retailer is going to have the final gatekeeping responsibility to make sure that properly stuff is going out. Better. I don't think we need to add anything that's clear, but I'll just check. And what is, can you remind me with the 904D and 907C? Sorry. I just, uh, if I look on my computer. So 904D um, says each cultivator shall create packaging for its cannabis. So that's, that that may, I mean, I think, however, that it's still within the requirements are within the concept of what you're talking about already. It's yeah. just going to be talking about that this, this, this production date and so forth. And so I would argue that it's actually largely in line with what you're thinking. The interest supply chain requirements. And then 907C has this more specific <laughs> and this is more specific to what consumers need to have. So then this, maybe this doesn't need to be there because it's kind of asking the cannabis, it's, make, it's pushing this burden to the cultivator and not necessarily the retail. Well, so this, one of the strange things in the statute is that cultivators aren't specifically empowered to package. So if cultivation, so if you are selling to a retailer, you're supposed to have it it's it's an odd thing. It's saying that cultivators, you know, have to ensure that packaging includes this stuff, but they aren't specifically empowered to package themselves. So the concept, I think, when we drafted this was that um, they have to ensure that it has this, but the people giving it to them where it's intended for sale to a consumer without an additional sort of packaging step, which shouldn't wouldn't happen in the retailer space. Uh, has to ensure that they are meeting those requirements. So just your bottom line conclusion is that we have to leave that the way it is. The sub two, B, B2. I, for selling to a retailer, yeah. For the other stuff we can. Yep. Okay. I think, yeah, for the other stuff, 904D is essentially what you listed when you spoke yeah. earlier at this meeting. All right, well then uh, we'll leave that the way it is and then we'll change 2.2.8, but we can leave, well, it'll probably be 2.2.8B when we change this because we'll, we'll have a differentiation between packaging requirements for retail sale versus packaging requirements for kind of interest supply chain sale. All right. Anyone anyone else on this section? Let's 
So my next is 2.3.8. Uh, so yeah, I'm just curious why this is submitting after you submit your application. Um, should this be part of the application period? Maybe we decided that you know someone might not know at the time of application potentially. Um, I think that's that's part of it. I mean, I think I'm hopeful that we can get things under a right schedule that will allow folks to have the most clarity that they possibly can upon licensure. But let's say that we do run into speed bumps and folks can't get licensed before June and that subjects them to a different style schedule medium, so on and so forth. They might have to pivot. Um, you know, and is that applicable to the pickle that we're in? now versus three or four years from now. I think it's more applicable to now than once we've kind of got a system of, you know, repeated success in place. But were you thinking of waiving the 60 day? No, I just, I was curious why it's, that this information just wouldn't be part of an application. Um, but if there's a reason that it might not be available, then that's fine. Um, I think some of it's just dependent on other actors, other potential state agencies, or securing folks to come pick up your waste. And I think it was just trying to allow folks to seek a license without, in lieu of having all their ducks in a row. You know, I would talk about things in the past. So, so anytime it says submitting plans, you know, it's kind of along the lines of where I, I wonder if um, people are going to easily be able to comply with this. I mean, can you just I know that we've discussed this and this is we've discussed it even earlier today. Um, but what kind of we envision for a waste management plan, a pest management plan, and then a plan to secure regulated products? You want me to talk to you about what I envision that plan looking like? Yeah. Just I, I don't very think it's high level. I don't think it it's not very prescriptive. I think, you know, the way the subcommittees pitched it and the way that I remember discussing it in slides is it's very descriptive um, into what you're intending to do. I think as you know, Julie and I have talked about, the more discretion that we allow, it's harder to develop a bright line test on what's satisfactory and what's not. Um, you know, I know that that doesn't necessarily answer your question here, but I think, you know, whether it's 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 your preferred style of waste management, whether it's burning or you know pyrolysis through biochar or whatever the case may be, I think it's just informing us on how you intend to do certain things because not everything's going to go right for you and your your cultivation. And I think you know even cultivation schedule or grow medium, like you know the wastewater issue that we talked about. I mean, depending on your medium you might not have a lot of wastewater. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just kind of helping us kind of. I was specifically just looking at E, F, and G, sorry. Um, but uh, so waste management plan, I can understand that. It's just, you, you know, choose one from the list or if you have something else, submit it. Pest management plan. I think a pest management plan is absolutely crucial to yeah. being part of this because I think I want folks to start thinking, you know, even if I have 125 plants, maybe only 80 of them make them make it to market. And if there is a problem with, you know, certain parts of your grow operation, how do you isolate that? And then you know, it doesn't result, result in complete crop loss failure. And there are steps that you can take to start thinking about certain things ahead of time that I think will be valuable um, and allow you to pivot. I think, you know, I'm thinking about myself and how how we. I want to say we in terms of humans, generally speaking, but if you don't plan for something and something goes wrong, you may be more inclined to do something that somebody who has taken the time to think about something might, you might not otherwise do. It's a knee jerk reaction and you might be like, oh man, I'm going to lose everything. I need to use this applicator in order to save my crop. When you know, you know, if you had the time to think about it, you probably wouldn't have done that because it might be something else that's illegal or whatever the case may be. So I, I'm trying to help folks get a head start on management of, of stuff that goes wrong. 
you know, I think it's a don't expect it to be a huge paperwork exercise or super onerous, but I think that there's some requirements that need to be in place. Right. And because about- it affects our market. Too. Our whole crop goes down and that's not just for a small cultivator, but for anybody, it affects the supply demand, you know? No, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say philosophically, I think when we issue a license, we want to know that whoever we're issuing it to has kind of thought this through. Yeah. I- and I think it's kind of what, where we came down earlier today, which is it's really good to start this thought process earlier. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, again, like even our model includes a degree of randomness, right? Because we're issuing licenses to be able to grow, but we're not putting them on a schedule on when certain products will actually make it to market. So I think, you know, that that schedule or that irrigation plan, if applicable, kind of helps in that context, I mean, waste management plan, I think that that's necessary at the start. I mean, that's why it's within 60 days of getting a license. But do we need that for small cultivators? Maybe we don't. You know, I know there's still some questions around composting companies and, and whether or not they want to actually get into this curve of picking up waste from cannabis products. So um, what about G? That's the only one that kind of sticks out to me a little bit i mean our pesticides that are going to be allowed in this industry are they just not widely available yeah you know they're not necessarily widely available and they're they're heavily regulated by the agency of agriculture um, on what you can and cannot use and deal as far as how you're getting the products themselves i'm i'm inclined to agree that maybe that's not necessary but i'd want to have conversations with the agency of agriculture um, on whether or not we're stepping on their toes or this isn't necessary or yeah, i mean i wouldn't I, w- I wouldn't want to get into a situation where someone assumes that they're going to use a certain type of pesticide that's allowed and then it's not available and nothing's available so i think you know planning ahead for that is, is important i just if these if, you, if the plan is I'm just going to go down to Abishan and pick it up off the shelf, you know, I don't I don't think we need to know that, you know. Yeah, no. And yeah, OK. I mean, it's only a question. I, I don't know. It's it's really just I don't have a good answer. Is there, so yeah. I'd want to talk to Carrie. Yeah, you know. that's fine. That makes sense to me. I just. Yeah, if that if that's going to be the response that we see for every small cultivator, I just wonder if it's if there's any value to us asking for it. Um, but if they're not widely available, if they are heavily regulated, if there are supply chain issues, you know, it's better that, you know, a cultivator know that at the outset, as opposed to just assuming that it's going to be there when they need it. All right. So no, no changes here. Not yet. Let's circle back. Let's put a pin in it. Okay. Uh, I got a pretty significant jump to five point two point five point three. So let me know if anyone has anything in between. Can I just ask because I could not remember for two point four point one? Was that really the I mean um when you were working with the subcommittee, Kyle, did you think about this from the, I mean, I'm sure you did, from the perspective of small cultivators and being able to work within sort of like what fencing is and the security, or is there anything that could be reduced from that? Yeah, so I mean, if you look at 2.4.3, there is an entire laid out schedule of what is required. So if you're a tier one, you only need one of those seven practices. And so we made those accommodations for small cultivators specifically recognizing that you need to secure your premises or your your cultivation site the the larger that it is. And as far as fencing goes, the word fencing is found in the statute. So the subcommittee looked creatively on how to provide the most um, flexibility with respect to fencing. And I think what you know, we chose to do is not define what fencing actually 
is. I don't think that they anticipated that fencing would look like super gauged chain link fencing or anything like that. I think that there's other less restrictive fencing options out there that that we'll see. So, um, but again, fencing isn't required for small cultivators, but you need to pick one of these other security um, requirements for for your cultivation site. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just to note on 2.4.2a, it does say that fencing must be sufficient to prevent unauthorized entry of the cultivation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else on uh, security requirements? Nope. Okay. 2.5.3. Energy standards for buildings. We've heard a lot of, about this in the public comments. And I don't want to do too much to mess with this. Just, you know, again, when we heard from Efficiency Vermont and the public service department, you know, really struck me something I didn't know how, you know, environmentally harmful um, or impactful, I should say, indoor controlled environment cultivation is. But that being said, I kind of come back to one of my earlier points that people um, that are home occupancies uh, in particular are already doing this. You know, the environmental impacts are already being felt for the most part. Um, you know, so we're not necessarily, you know, increasing the carbon footprint of the industry by waiving, um, let's see, let's just stick with this one, uh, A, um, or home occupancies, 5.3, maybe just the whole thing. I think if you're going out and leasing a space or you're building a new, a new facility, that you should come up to, you know, a CVES, but um, you know, potentially if you're just you know growing in your basement or your spare bedroom, um, that it doesn't make sense for us to require that you kind of essentially potentially renovate it. I'd be comfortable making the accommodation for folks doing it through a home occupation. I'm not sold on it for any other, and, and I haven't. I've heard more about it from folks looking to do retail establishments and larger grows, and I empathize, but at the same time, um, I'm not ready to to exempt CBS from, from anything other than home occupation right now. Yeah. So, I mean, when I think about just like the, the major cost drivers for small cultivators, one, I mean, access to land, two, it's this, three mm -hmm. is testing. So, you know, and I've, I've got a call just with Jacob our kind of energy advisor tomorrow about whether what kind of impact this might have in Vermont in particular. So I might change my mind, but my kind of initial gut reaction was to waive this for home occupancies. I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm okay with that. And especially even B, I think people just need to look at what our definition of greenhouse actually is within the context of of indoor versus outdoor because you know the hoop houses that are outside that aren't erected or i think i think through um more generic terminology not related to cannabis it's used it's not more than erected for 180 days i think i don't have the definition in front of me but we said in use for the production or cultivation of cannabis for 180 days like those are outdoor grows not indoor grows so they would not be subject to cbds but greenhouses otherwise would be if you're if you're uh not so strictly using natural light. I mean, this to me and a few of the other places kind of pushes me slightly in the direction closer to, you know, having this smaller micro, small grower. Mm -hmm. But I think for now. Yeah, I mean, I don't want folks that been doing it in their home to have to update their whole and I'm, I'm not an electrician, but update their whole circuit breaker and everything else to like kind of come into compliance. I don't, 
think that's necessary. Do I want folks setting their houses on fire? No. So it's kind of um, it, yeah, it, it almost makes you. I'm uh, starting to come around to the idea. We just have a home occupancy license type. It's a micro grow that's less than a thousand square feet. But again, I think, you know, I haven't quite tipped in that direction quite yet. I like to kind of think about all of the things that we're, we're making accommodations for tier one home occupancy growers versus other tier one and see if if in aggregate there's a there's a need to have kind of a yeah, and I mean, it's generally speaking, as far as energy standards for buildings, like this is something that every commercial enterprise in the state has to follow. And what I don't want to see is in five years when we're not meeting our climate goals as a state, or if we're not meeting our climate goals as a state, you know, it, it, indoor cannabis, it doesn't have the, the, the data still is out because this, the regulated market has only been around for 10 years elsewhere, but I think we all can acknowledge that, you know, there's a lot of climate impacts around cannabis grown inside, and I do not want the crosshairs to switch from wherever they wherever they else may be in the state of Vermont to our program as the main reason that we're not meeting certain uh, climate or energy goals as a state. So on 2.5.4 and 2.5.5, the only thing that I was thinking here is giving tier one cultivators a year to meet to come up with these standards. Essentially giving them a, a year worth of revenue to kind of help shift some of their older, you know, lighting systems um, in order to come into compliance with this. But again, I didn't do the heavy lifting on coming up with this section. And, you know, I am going to, like I said, call Jacob tomorrow. Yeah, what that would mean. I think I think his perspective would be helpful, but I would I would submit that, you know, I worked with Jacob pretty closely on developing these standards and we certainly had small cultivators in mind. And I think one of the challenges around this part of our regulation specifically is and that I've said to a host of different people that have asked me about these standards thus far is we look at these words. And they don't mean a lot on first blush. They're scary because they're they're foreign in the way that the energy code works and the term, specific terminology that's associated with it. I will tell you that we worked with Efficiency Vermont to make sure that these standards are not a barrier to entry and so that you can still use services like Efficiency Vermont for them to cost share in getting up to code with a lot of these standards. So I I I think a lot of it is on us from a guidance perspective to help folks with a starting point in determining what these mean. Um, and we did kind of tweaks, Jacob and I did tweak some of the recommendations from PSD to make them a little bit more user friendly, especially in the types of, of lighting systems um, that, that'll, that'll be present here. Yeah. But, um, I can I can appreciate how it is a cost and a and a perceived barrier to entry. I think what I would like to do is put a pin on it and let's have some more discussion with yeah. with certain folks before we make that waiver. Yeah. Um, and if there is a waiver, I want to see that certain that that folks have contacted Efficiency Vermont and that they're working to get on there, or else it's just going to be another issue when. Their, their registration comes up for renewal. Right. We're going to hear the same the same concerns that it's cost prohibitive, and we hear from a lot of folks on how sustainable that they are without government regulation right now. And when we put regulations in to move us in a forward-thinking, sustainable program, and rubber meets the road, folks get a little anxious and nervous because it affects their bottom line. But I still think this the long-term sustainability of our program outweighs that I'm, I'm with you on that and i know that if i were starting a a grow i would certainly want to build you know to these standards as opposed to kind of buying less efficient standards and having to replace them within a year so you know i'm, I'm really just thinking about giving the folks that are currently cultivating small cultivators a year to come into compliance. But again, I uh, am happy to kind of 
talk to Jake. I've talked to some of the folks at Efficiency Vermont and think about what kind of impact that might have. And uh, yeah, and I would be more comfortable waiving some reporting requirements than general okay. standards. I do have some of that coming up too. Anything else on on these two sections or these three, 2.5.3 through? Oh, and again, I appreciate how this this is as far as startup costs, this can be a lot or you know whatever the case may be. But I think the long term viability of our program and the sustainable direction that we're trying to take it as far as a forward thinking one from an energy and environmental one in the state. Uh, I think it's important that we don't completely let the bottom fall out of it. I mean, if 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 20 to 40 or upwards of that of our market is made of small cultivators and we're exempting all of these energy requirements from them, then how can we really get a good feel for our impact on the environment? You know, that's kind of where I need to see more from through comment or otherwise on how we view these other than just. Yeah. Uh, and again, I, I'm not saying wave them, you know, a lot of good thinking went into creating them. It would just be giving kind of a one year period for people to ramp up. I'm not opposed, but let's, uh, run it by the the folks smart i mean hey i i have a master's in environmental policy and went to do the whole law school around environmental stuff and energy stuff is its own subsect of of a language and it's challenging to kind of wrap your head around unless you're specifically educated on it yeah all right on 2.5.6 some of the reporting requirements I'm looking specifically at waiving um, B and C for tier one cultivators. Yeah, I mean, a much more. My gut reaction is a much more. Let's waive reporting fees or reporting requirements versus um, other things. It's not one or the other, but I think yeah. I think it makes sense to waive some reporting requirements. And maybe some of these things are good if, you know, engagement with energy efficiency programs. If, if you are going to seek to, if we end up saying that you can have a one year kind of ramp up period with respect to 2.5.5 or 4, 2.5.4, as long as you're actively engaging with these, with these folks. But we can, we can come back to that. Um, that is, uh, that's it for me. That, with respect to small cultivators, I, mean, I got a, a lot of other notes around other things, but when it comes specifically to kind of waiving provisions for small cultivators, that's all I had. Anyone else have anything that they want to add? All right, now. I think once we talk about it more in the broad sense of every license type. There'll be some other conversations to have, but in context of small cultivators, that's it right now. Good. All right, then. Um, why don't we, uh, I think we have public comment is our last agenda item. Um, why don't we uh, open it up to a public comment? If you um, if you join, we have one person who joined us. Public, no? Yeah. You want to make a comment? Sure. Great. If you don't mind just coming up here just so that uh, we can get you closer to the microphone. Oh, great. How's it going, guys? Where is the mic? Okay. Um, boy, I'm, I, I'm a little pleased to hear you guys waving a lot of this stuff for the small cultivators. Um, that is pretty much my number one concern here. Um, it's, it seems like there are still a lot of, of barriers here to the entry um, and a lot of costs associated with that that are just going to push people away. Like if I'm, if I'm a regular guy looking at this and I'm thinking of starting a grow operation or, a, you know, anything like that, I'm reading all these rules and I'm thinking, wow, this would just be easier to grow the weed myself and sell it to my friends or cannabis. I'm sorry. <laughs> But, uh, you know, just the application process 
for the licensing is daunting to look at, you know? You'd need a lawyer to rip through. I mean, I've been sort of paying attention to some of this stuff. And it's it makes my head spin. So for a normal, like, I have friends back, I'm from the Northeast Kingdom. I have friends up there, you know, they, they're not super highly educated. They're certainly not lawyers. And when they look at this stuff, they, they're just like, why bother? You know, that's where a lot of my friends right now are sitting there. That they can't wait for this to open because the prices are going to be jacked up like they are in Massachusetts. And it's going to make them their product more competitive on the black market where they can turn around and say, hey, I can make the edibles, you know, for a fraction of the price, put them in a paper bag and hand them to somebody. You know? uh, and I, I really think that this is just going to drive a lot more people towards the black market. And if you're looking to include people, I think a lot of a lot of these things, and well, some of them are a lot of the energy stuff. You know, I like that. You should be using energy efficient lights and all that stuff. But a lot of people just don't have the money for that. You know, this is especially in the Northeast Kingdom. You know, it's not a it's not a rich area. We don't have a lot of money up there. And I I really feel like they're going to look at this stuff and use it as an opportunity to expand their footprint in the black market which I don't have a problem with, but clearly you guys are trying to invite people into this and there's still a lot. And I, and I really do appreciate all of the waving of a lot of these rules were stuff that I was going to comment on and you've waved a lot of them out of there. And I, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, the, the packaging was another big thing. That's going to be very cost prohibitive, especially I see you're proposing 50 milligrams of edibles in a package. That's, that's nothing for some people. That's not even, one dose you know if you're a medical patient you have cancer i know guys that eat 100 200 at a time now you're gonna make all of these packages you know like for instance my friend will give me 600 milligrams of edibles at once for 60 dollars in one paper bag that is recyclable uh, now for that same thing i'd have to buy 12 packages at 50 milligrams a piece um, i don't know what kind of packaging we're talking about here but in massachusetts i see it's non-recyclable now we've got 12 non-recyclable packages going into a landfill somewhere, which is certainly a concern of mine. Um, you know, and uh, it's, again, it's going to favor the larger operations with more money to invest in renewable packaging, stuff like that, which is, you know, it's out there, but it's more expensive. Um, I thought I thought some of the labeling requirements were, I mean, I had cigarettes here and those are the warning label on these is less strict than uh and i realize there's still some differences federally with the scheduling and all that stuff but you know um even alcohol you know alcohol doesn't come in a tamper proof package you know a kid can just screw the lid off and start drinking so i i think that's another uh i don't know it's labeled kind of like uh oxycontin Keep out of reach of children, you know, or like a household cleaning chemical. Um, and I think uh, I'd like to talk to you guys more privately, but I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for making the drive. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Um, so again, this is our public comment period. Um, I see a couple of hands raised. If you uh, join via the link, we'll start. With you, just raise your virtual hand. We'll call on you in the order um, that you raise your hand. I'm seeing the first person, um, Jay. J A Y. Feel free to unmute yourself and make a comment. Jay, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Um, hello. It's getting better. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep, we can. Awesome. Sorry about that. Um, I guess my questions are a lot along the lines of the last commenter. Um, so I, I, I've been following this as close as possible, just like anybody else. And it seems like you're trying really hard to make it so that you're fulfilling the projected demand with the one through 5,000 tier licenses. 
And if that is the case, you're going to need, you know, at least a thousand of the five thousand square foot licenses or split down to the smaller ones. So I guess where I'm at is the same as the other guy. Like I know a whole bunch of people that already grow a thousand square feet and don't really want to spend thirty thousand dollars for you to say it's okay for them to do that so i guess what i'm getting at is if you're actually trying to keep the large business out then you have to reassess how you're including the small cultivators and that is all i have to say thank you thanks jay um, Zachary Tyson. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry, we have it on multiple screens. One second. All right, I think we're good now. Um, so yeah, hi, my name is Zachary yeah. Tyson. I'm with Mr. Z Craft Cannabis. First, I wanted to thank the board for all of their hard work and it's greatly appreciated and you have my continued support throughout this process. Um, my comment today is on banking services for the cannabis companies. Um, I personally have been having trouble finding bank or credit unions that are willing to handle normal deposit services for cannabis companies. So if there's any guidance from the board on this, that would be incredibly helpful, I think, for all applicants. Um, and I don't know if there's been any behind the scenes work with any of these banks or credit unions, but a little clarity on that would definitely be helpful. So thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Zach. Amelia? Hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Um, so my comment is in regard to people being able to bring their own genetics into the market um, through cloning, which I think is really, really important to allow. Um, I think especially so there are a couple a couple points I want to make, but the first being that we are currently operating under the definition of canopy mixing flowering plants and veg plants. And when you enforce that, and you also force people to start their genetics from seed rather than take bring their own clones in, um, you're asking farmers to play genetics roulette essentially with the sex of their plants. Um, you know, you could start 40 seeds and maybe get, you know, 30, 35 females if you're lucky, or you could get 15 to 20 females. Um, but that limits, you know, the number of viable plants you have then going into flower and makes it harder to estimate your output. Um, and yeah, I just, I think that if you're going to define canopy as flowering and veg together, you can't then tell people that they have to uh, work from seed only and they can't bring their clones in. My second point, I don't know um, if any of you have looked at the cost of seeds lately, uh, but they're very expensive and they're sold in six to 10 per pack. So if you look at the cost of a 10 pack of seeds, you know, it can go anywhere from 80 to three, four hundred dollars, depending on the quality of the genetics and the popularity of the breeder. So that's an insane expense, uh, especially for somebody just starting out, you know, their nursery. Um, and my final point is that if you don't allow existing legacy uh, growers to bring their own genetics into market, they just won't come into the market or, as I've already seen, they'll plan for ways to get around this rule, um, which is obviously what you don't want. I see this as another instance of regulating people into noncompliance. Um, and, you know, my final point is medically we're constantly striving to produce better genetics to treat medical symptoms and that's really hard to do if you can't take clones um you know it, when you have regular seeds and i'm not talking about feminized seeds i'm talking about regular seeds that is a much broader range of phenotypical expression that if you then can't clone is hard to nail down and to improve upon um, and a lot of really good medicine that's currently in Vermont comes from clone-only strains that have been around since the 90s. 
um, that people are definitely want to going to want to bring both into market and that people on the market are going to want to buy. Um, yeah, and I also have some thoughts on social media, yes. but I'll follow up with that uh, in private after this. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Vito. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you're all having a great day. Um, I just want to comment again about commercial building standards. Um, it's not about it's not just about new buildings or home basement and home grows. Many of us are repurposing buildings and we have to go through the change of use process. And that's that's uh, what I've been talking about. And, um, you know, specifically meeting um, the the current standards for insulation. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm repurposing a building. Um, I don't I think the installation is like R30. We're, we're not 100 percent sure yet, but um, to, for me to bring that up to R40 is going to cost over fifty thousand dollars. So it, it's a really, really substantial cost. So I think that if you could please also include relaxing these building standards for tier two as well, uh, I think that would be great. And, and let's be real. I think the tier two is the actual craft license because uh, you know, if a thousand square foot flowering is not going to mean flowering canopy, then um, you know you're you're going to need a 2,500 square foot license to to meet what what would have been a thousand square foot flowering canopy, and uh, and this affects a lot more than the bottom line, as Kyle was saying. It's it definitely affects many black market players from just getting in this game, um, and uh, and also I I agree with that first speaker. Uh, that was a refreshing dose of reality. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Tito. Ron W. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Um, so this is Ronald Williams from uh, Mr. Z Craft Cannabis. Um, and I'm calling in regards to rule two, uh, social media and advertising. Um, so I believe that Vermont should allow smaller to mid tier uh, to feature product images on social media uh, and require the bios to say 21 and only not for sale. Um, in the business pages bio. I want to know that this is the industry standard, um, especially for the mature markets. And I think that the state should allow the standard and also defer to Instagram's platform based moderation process uh, and, and for most other social media platforms. Um, Chairperson Pepper, you noted that these platforms are self moderated and they have their own standards for that. Um, I do want to also note that those standards are fairly stringent and restrictive. Um, for example, Instagram already prevents sale of alcohol and cannabis to minors or any alcohol or cannabis sales for that matter through the platform. Um, the, you know, the policy prohibits uh, cannabis establishments from promoting their business by providing contact information, uh, email addresses, street addresses, such as, you know, if you look at Lawson's page, for example, uh, you cannot buy directly from them, but they are able to advertise. Um, and utilize the contact them button and such to these platforms. So, you know, that's a really important distinction. Um, if these posts are restricted to lifestyle alone, I feel that the consumer won't be exposed to the quality of the product that Vermont farmers can produce. Um, you know, this especially rings true, I think, from a representation standpoint as well. It is incredibly important for us as a social equity brand uh, to be able to feature on these platforms without having to engage large marketing firms and such, um, you know. These restrictions could favor lifestyle and well-funded larger cultivators rather than letting the quality of the farming speak for itself. Um, I, I think that's you know really important to the CCB. I would imagine it is to the state as well. And I would like to you know not have the Vermont cannabis market favor large cultivators with ample resources to deploy marketing firms and strategies at ease. Uh, thank you, and I really really appreciate everybody's efforts here. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Um, THC Analytics. Yes, hello. Uh, this is Eddie Plantillas with THC Analytics. Uh, we are a small laboratory who is an independent testing laboratory in Vermont. Uh, and a couple of uh, comments on, in regards to Section 2. Um, they are, when it says regulations are applicable to all cannabis establishments. Uh, we are not going to have any uh, uh, warning labels or uh, a lab wouldn't have any of these things like warning labels, packaging. Uh, well, we will have tracking, transportation. 
uh, but there's a few things here written more specifically for cultivators and uh, and producers uh, rather than laboratories. Uh, we will not be uh, selling a product to the customer, so we wouldn't be much um, tied with war warning labels and packaging. Um, uh, we have compliance and theft of law laws. Uh, it's just a comment that it's uh, a, list, a bit a bit ambiguous and it adds us into things that we will not be um, part of. Um, and the other thing is that I really hope you are, guys are looking into, again, give us a bit more clarification on what a harvest lot is, because like I mentioned before, uh, I could, I could plant, uh, you know, one plant a thousand feet or a thousand plants in a thousand feet, and you're telling me that I only have to test, a, you know, uh, a fraction of that uh, on your on your rules. Um, but those are my only two comments. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And just on your first point, if you wouldn't mind submitting a comment that kind of directs us to the specific sections that shouldn't apply to, to labs. That would be helpful for the board. Um, next on the list is Dan Frank. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yep, we can hear yep. you. Thank you, uh, board members, for your time and attention. I have two questions. I'll be brief. On November 26th, I posted on the public comments a uh, uh, presentation from Biotouch Media. Uh, I wanted to find out if each of you have reviewed the presentation, again posted November 26th, and uh, do you have a serious interest in having Tom Mern, the CEO, uh, give you a presentation in detail as to how Biotouch Media could make an effective uh, valued contribution to the Vermont Cannabis Control Board in terms of its mission. Is that your, is that the end of your comment, Dan? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you, yeah. Uh, we'll, we don't generally answer questions specifically during this period, otherwise it really turns into something other than a public comment period, but we'll get in touch with you offline about that. Thank you. Um, next, I have uh, Dan Guest. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, thanks for giving me a moment. Um, first, I'd just like to recognize, you know, you guys as the board, I can completely see how dedicated you guys are to this and how much detail it requires. So I appreciate that, um, you know, cannabis legalization unfolding is unprecedented and so you know there's going to be a big learning curve for everybody but i appreciate the effort um i'll be super brief with my comments the first one is regarding the track and trace um i would just make the recommendation to not use metric metric is implemented by every um, adult use state except for washington and it's incredibly overbearing um, to the farmer um, for instance you're required to weigh all of the product that is pruned off a plant, you know, wet. This is just an example of, of something wasteful. So say that you're in your field and you're removing, you know, leaf and excess plant particles. Really, it has no value. You know, nobody's going to become intoxicated, but you need to take the time and the labor to weigh that product and implement that into the system. Um, same with all the drying protocols. You have to weigh the plant wet then you have to wait again dry, then you have to weigh all the, the stems and the waste product. And I think there's just gotta be a lot easier way to explain that you're gonna compost the waste material. Um, so I would just make a recommendation to avoid using metric. And I'd be very curious to hear what Vermont decides to do for track and trace. Um, I would definitely make a, a strong urge to speak with uh, community members and cultivators and try to find a middle ground so people can have um, the necessary, you know, compliance to make sure that product stays within the system, but not to place unnecessary overburdening measures on growers. Um, <clears throat> the next comment that I just wanted to make briefly is about uh, the plant count. Um, in the last meeting, I know that there was discussion between um, combining the indoor and the outdoor licenses, and I think that it would be a big mistake to use plant counts at all. 
plant counts were something that was used by the federal government to imprison people and have more evidence and harsher penalties. But in any type of agriculture, you want to use the square footage. I understand that outdoors, you know, people may grow larger plants um, and have the advantage of the sun tracking across the sky versus a horizontal reflector in an indoor grow room. Uh, but the appropriate way to measure cannabis really should be done through square footage, and it's up to each farmer how they choose to use and maximize that space. But I, I would think that uh, getting rid of plant counts altogether makes a lot of sense. I think that if you spoke to different experts, there's got to be some other ways to just come up with <clears throat> square footage allotments. Um, another very quick thing, I just wanted to applaud you guys on the comments about outdoor hoops being considered part of an outdoor cultivation. Um, I had a question about seasonal lighting. I, I had mentioned in a, <clears throat> a letter that I wrote just about light deprivation which is a way for outdoor farmers to maybe get a second crop out of the year. Um, sometimes people use very low light intensity for just several weeks in the spring in some of those hoop houses to extend their um, vegetative cycle of a, a, a crop so that they can get it to the right size before flowering. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys could include some detail or information about very minimal and seasonal lighting in those hoops and it's still being um, listed as an outdoor um, cultivation. And then the very last comment that I would have is about the social media. I agree with the, the last commenter, um, you know, as long as people are staying with industry standards and, you know, not advocating anything illegal, you know, I'd love to see um, Vermont cannabis businesses be able to tell their stories and promote adequately on, on social media and contribute, you know, education and, and culture. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Um, Shauna Kolakowski. Hi, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm on my wife's account. <laughs> oh, sure. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, so actually my comment was kind of contrary to the previous comment, um, especially I'm trying to go in as a small grower, but I can't, I, I'd like to do to the range between about 50 to 100 plants, but trying to calculate a canopy size and guess the growth of my plants coming three months down the line. I've seen if I want to do over 50 plants, my estimations put me at 2,500 square feet. Um, I would love, because I thought I heard you mention a thousand square feet, kind of at about a hundred plant range. If maybe just for small tier growers, if we could go with a plant size, that would let me know how much to start for in the spring, what to expect, where to go. I believe that the size of the plant reflects just the grow style of the cannabis cultivator. And also with the geographical makeup of Vermont, I'm not looking at planting this like corn. So trying to utilize different squares or rectangles of the property that I have available, trying to calculate that out, making sure that my plants are gonna fit in that come three months later, whether I'm growing an indica plant, which is much bushier and wider as to a sativa, which is gonna be taller and more narrow. I think there's way too much guesstimation in that. And I think that going to a plant count could solve a lot of problems as well as a certain plant count of flowering with a certain percentage of that count allowed for growth or nursery in the vegetative stages. And I think that's all I got. Thank you. Um, Glenn Anderson. Yeah, hey, how's everybody doing here? Great. So, um, and thank you for taking my comment. Um, you know, I spoke on Friday uh, primarily just to weigh in on packaging regarding the uh, you know, some of the pieces that VMS was advocating for. Um, and I see, you know, some of the pieces of age um, still in the packaging for retail. Um, so I just want to reiterate that's, you know, again, this is medicine that uh, some people, even under the age of 25, 21, et cetera, um, are currently using. And so I want to just advocate that whatever is the final language reflects something of respect for people that are, um, you know, in that space where that is their medicine. So I hope we don't blur that line between recreational and medicinal and lose, you know, focus on that fact. So uh, that was one point. Uh, I did see the fact that, um, you know, as far as the small cultivator license uh, with respect to having family uh, in the establishment, I use that as, you know, a positive. I, I would 
go so far as to advocate for that to apply um, across the board in tiers uh, respect to uh, you know family businesses. Uh, I grew up in a, a family business, and I know what it's like uh, when times are great, but I also know when times are really hard, sometimes it requires the entire family to be all hands on deck, and sometimes that means underage children in facilities. So, you know, I think bringing that sense of um, not normality, but just a reality, right? Because we are all humans. This stuff happens frequently where we have to work on a weekend and it's mom and pop on deck, right? And the baby's there. So, you know, I just, as the, as certain voices are being heard with respect to, you know, making things look like Surgeon General warnings, I just really want to hear that um, pushback. And, and I hope you hear that from me. Um, the second piece is I would hope that that would apply across all tiers just because that family business aspect. And I chatted with Tim Fair this weekend. I would like to actually um, pursue some of these pieces as far as in statutes and with the legislature, because I realize that's not something that you're uh, commissioned with and tasked with at this moment. But I do really want to see and have the board even thinking about what is a real farm, right? Because there's a huge difference between an urban and suburban um, big metal grow indoor right and an outdoor cultivation and i do really appreciate the board's work in creating small uh, cultivator license components and that actually was something that um, tim and i were chatting about which was uh, for our collective you know we essentially have a compliance management system it's not seed to sale it's not metric or any of the others but we ideally will integrate with those pieces if required that being said um you know, that's going to raise all kinds of questions about what's that USB connector, right? So, um, you know, I'm in a position where, you know, I just want to create a compliance system for our members so that as they're licensed, hopefully, through the system here in Waterbury and as we move forward, uh, we want to have a unified database so that a lot of those standard pieces you're asking for are just easily um just implemented, right? So whether it's an ID card and a laminate getting printed because there's a new employee on board, um, or making sure that the disposal waste uh, products is met satisfactorily to the board's uh, needed uh, planning and, and uh, reporting. So that's something that we're doing, but I also want to make sure that while we're trying to license ourselves, that we're not shooting ourselves in the foot if there's any um, ethical issues with that. So any guidance on that would be uh, greatly appreciated. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, Matt? Matt Guest. Hey, hello, it's Matt. Thanks for letting me speak. Uh, just a few points I, I wanted to make, and I'm probably going to reiterate some uh, that was already mentioned. Uh, one thing that I've been thinking about, as I'm sure most folks are, uh, and I know we've had some of these discussions before, but I have not seen any protocols as to how or in what capacity or in what set of numbers a legacy, and I hate the word legacy, I'm going back to black market, black market growers can bring their genetics to market. We allowed to bring one mom plant, we allowed to bring 3000 clones if we're in a bigger license. I don't think there has been any guidance as to how that moves into the legal market. And I think that's a big concern for a lot of people that have spent an enormous amount of time hunting, selecting, and refining these cuts to get them to where they are, to get them to where they know how to grow them, they know how to feed them, they know exactly what they need, and that's the epitome of the craft grower right there, and that's what this market should look like. So I don't know if it's been written anywhere, I haven't seen it, but understanding and figuring out how these legacy black market growers can get their genetics into this market is one thing that I think needs to be addressed. Um, <clears throat> as far as packaging, um, you know, as a hemp farmer, we have used biodegradable and compostable packaging from day one. It's relatively cheap. Uh, I think if the state could mandate something like that, because this industry has a waste stream problem, I uh, would love to see that addressed uh, in a manner that is responsible, sustainable, and goes with good standards and protocols. Um, I think several people had spoken about plant counts. I am in full agreement with every one of them that spoke that I think we should get rid of numbers and just go to canopy size because everyone's going to do it differently. Uh, and I think everyone has a, a very different system how they do this. So plant counts are confining. Canopy size is entirely not. 
I would love to see canopy size over plant counts if possible. Um, my last comment uh, kind of goes to the advertising marketing side of things uh, in reference to the word organic. Um, this is a term that has been regulated for decades. Uh, it shows kind of a higher tier of uh, production. There's associated costs uh, and protocols and other things that have to be met to use that term. And my worry is, is that every farmer in this state is gonna call themselves organic to get that top tier. We have several certification companies that have been working in this industry for decades now. Um, I know the term is regulated and controlled by the USDA under the National Organic Program, which is a federal institution, and this is not a federal industry at this point. So my worry is I would hate to see that word diluted by allowing everyone that wanted or considers themselves to be organic to use that term. There's a lot that goes into it. And as someone who works in organic compliance and certifies farms, I can tell you there's an enormous amount of farms that would not pass, that have not passed, that couldn't. So I would like to see that word protected uh, and its integrity kept intact. With that said, Vermont's hemp program does allow those folks that are certified to forego pesticide testing. And I would love it if that is something that the state would consider because the cost of testing is probably one of the biggest things I think that's gonna ding people. And I don't think they realize how much it is. Uh, it's a lot, a full panel test is about $740 out of state. And so keeping that consumer protection would be great, but this might also be a way to incentivize people to get into a program, to have some sort of reduced testing, but increased scrutiny in other areas. And it's kind of a kind of a balancing act in a sense. So I know we've modeled some of this off the hemp program. This would be something that I, I would love to also possibly see. Uh, and part of it is, you know, going back to Clean Green, who I work for and have been certified through, uh, they do test for 118 different compounds before you even get a certification. Unlike the USDA and unlike NOFA, who don't test for anything, this is a little bit of more consumer protection. And it also protects the farmer knowing that what they're planting in is clean before they get into it. Uh, so those were my main comments. Uh, and thank you for your time as always. And I appreciate all your efforts. And I highly appreciate this meeting and all the efforts that you have done to help the small guy get into this market. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. So uh, I don't see anyone else uh, with their hand raised. There, we have a number of people who joined via the phone. If uh, if you join via phone and would like to make a comment, um, please hit star six to unmute yourself, and we'll just try and manage um, if multiple people comment at once. So I see seven eight one uh, nine three nine five three. Yep. Hi everybody. This is Ben Mervis calling in by phone today. Uh, thank you for the meeting and i just want to say you know i'm glad that we're hearing from so many legacy although i know that some folks don't like that term but uh legacy cultivators i think that you all are doing an excellent job keeping in mind something that i i think needs to be balanced which is the needs of these cultivators but also the needs of um the consumers who maybe are not currently buying cannabis because they're looking for a little bit more assurance and safety when it comes to lab tests um, I think that it's a great opportunity for these cultivators for, for us to prove to an entirely new customer base that Vermont growers have such high standards, particularly when it comes to the safety of the flower. Um, I also wanted to add in to the conversation about social media, great comments so far. Um, the specific policy that I've seen as best practice from operators in current markets um, and even from uh, other comparable industries is that we not be allowed to show the products being used. Um, that is a big one that often makes it into policies so that we can show the quality of the flower, but there is certainly a line as, as much as I love, and a lot of people have seen my work, I, I love to shoot somebody smoking a joint, but it's not strictly necessary for showing off the quality of the flower and attracting people to the market. Um, so that is some language that could be included. Uh, to go way back to the beginning of the 
the meeting, I wanted to thank board member Holberg for uh, seemingly taking the lead on this peer networking among social equity and economic empowerment candidates. Um, one topic that I would definitely suggest be included in the roster there is banking and other professional services, um, as we already heard from the Mr. Z group today. Uh, I wanted to go to a note that Kyle, uh, board member Harris, had made about incubation for cultivators, and it was a really poignant point about uh, how we want the industry to look. And uh, Kyle, I wanted you to know that you were heard with that. And I think that from, again, the customer standpoint, that's very important. Um, we've seen in established markets that I've worked in that there is a certain amount of marketing that needs to go into these sales, in particular to attracting new customers to the market, which will bring us to the valuation that is being placed on it. Um, and it does take a certain amount of spin to when you're being transparent about the quality of the product to talk about it being grown in a basement or in a spare room. Um, so I do think that cultivators who are doing that, certainly meaning no offense to them, but it would be helpful to think about how they could grow and progress into a more professional setting that makes their product that much more marketable and that much more saleable to customers. Um, I also think that, uh, sorry, I lost my thought there. Um, Oh, I also just want to say on that note, I think that there are certain incentives that the board has already put in place in terms of providing incubation space. Um, so hopefully there's a certain amount of that that will already shake out per your comment, Kyle, um, that folks will will offer these professional commercial spaces to cultivators who realize they would like to grow out of their, their smaller space. Um, I also just wanted to, my last point going with uh, Chairperson uh, Pepper's point about retail receiving from cultivators, it sounded like there, there's a lot here for you all to work out. I just wanted to um, call to attention that it definitely is an interest supply chain topic with um, cultivators who might be supplying flour in bulk to product manufacturers or to wholesalers who are also able to prepare the flour for the general market when it comes to these packaging, that it might be as simple as a, a simple, it, it might be as simple as saying that the cultivator just has to have a contract or an arrangement somewhere in the supply chain that accounts for X, Y, and Z being the testing, the testing results, the batch numbers, all of this. Um, and that the just putting the, the cultivator is required for making sure that that is taken care of once it leaves their hands, if they don't have to send it out the door that way themselves. Um, so thank you for bearing with me on that and have a great rest of your week. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks, Ben. So anyone else who joined via the phone, um, feel free to hit star six to unmute yourself. I'll just give it a minute there. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yep. Hi, it's Jesse with Old Growth Organics. Um, I'm at an airport, so if you, if an announcement goes off, just heads up, that's what it is. Um, thank you guys for putting this on. I haven't been able to catch every detail because uh, I've been traveling for my jaw. Um, but I, as I've been kind of growing with you guys and my dream has been taking off on its own, I my uh, partner and I are arriving in a position where we might end up with like a 5,000 square foot. Um, and opportunities are just being presented to us um, as a family because of networking and um, just because I guess it's the way it's supposed to go. Um, but I am still keeping to our foundation here, which is the reason we started this um, was because it was a skill my partner had for the past decade plus in the legacy market. Um, and we want to be with family. Um, so that's what this is all about for us, is we want to run a farm, um, a cannabis farm, but also you know, a sustainable property for our family and our community that we end up in. Um, and so I just wanted to plant the seed. I was, I was so shocked that someone else had talked about 
the family aspect of this just a few um, comments ago. So I was really excited about that. I was kind of cheering in my little seat over here. Um, so I don't know what we can do with that. I'm, I'll think about it, but I just wanted to make note of it as we're growing, I guess. Um, you know, we're not qualifying for this small cultivator uh, breaks anymore. Um, and I'm just imagining being regulated at our home. Um, so a lot of this, you know, we just have to roll with and see what's up. But I just wanted to put it in your guys' mind. Like maybe there's something, maybe we can work with this somehow. Like if it's a family business, um, because that's what we want. That's like one of our pillars in our mission here is to involve the community um, and to help people find a living wage, make, um, you know, provide skill training and all of these things. Like that's what it's about for us. So I don't know. I'll ponder these things and um, see where it goes. But thank you guys for your work. And um, I will talk to you again next time. Thanks, Jesse. Um, anyone else who joined via the phone, um, star six to unmute yourself if you'd like to make a comment. Glenn, I do see your hand raised. In the in these meetings, we don't generally have repeat commenters. Um, so if you have something you'd like to kind of add on to what you said already, please uh, feel free to email us um, at, uh, you know, our email address is all over the website. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. So I just want to uh, echo what Amelia said about being able to utilize clones. Um, it's very important. You know, there are people who have been phenol hunting certain, uh, you know, certain strains, certain phenotypes for a while now, and they would like to be able to use those clones. Uh, growing some seed is great, but actually express, yes, it is. It is expensive, but, you know, also the fact that there are certain varieties out there that are clone only. And, um, yeah, it's important that it's important that we're able to utilize that method. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't see any other public comments. Um, so uh, unless someone joins in the next, you know, few seconds here, I think um, we'll um, close out the meeting. I did want to just mention briefly that our official public comment period on rules three and four um, officially opens on Wednesday um, and runs till at least um, the 25th of February. Again, we staggered the filing of our rules, um, focusing on the ones that are most important for early adoption. And so, um, you know, any comments that anyone's made about rules three and four to date, uh, we the board will consider, but the official comment period opens on Wednesday. Um, so um, with that, um, I don't the we're through the agenda. Do you have any concluding thoughts for today? There's a lot to revisit, but <laughs> yep. that was a good meeting. Thanks everybody for your comments and we're getting there. Great. All right. Well, I'll um, adjourn the meeting then. Thank you.